Good morning, friends. Yeah, that is perfect. Check, I'd like Arjun, to voice is clear. Uh, thank, thank you. Thank you, Arjun. And uh, we hand over to Sangeet and Swapnil for further questions. Good morning, sir. We are morning, live friends. now. Yeah, that is perfect. Yeah. So it's uh, 9 a.m. Uh, Sangeet, sir, if we can begin the proceedings. Yeah, good morning, all. I welcome once again for the third master series. And uh, this is on trauma. We have four topics, four different topics the open wounds, the syndesmotic ankle injuries, the lateral wall of the intertrochantric fracture and the tibial condyle. So uh, we are going to have a nice interaction, a nice inputs and a lot of uh, cases to discuss here on this platform. To all my colleagues and my teachers, I wish you a happy teacher's day. And before we start with the program, uh, I would request all the faculties for the session, like we have four sessions. The first is on open fractures. The other faculty, unless you are asked, please uh, let the convener handle that faculty and uh, the conveners would be in charge of that. Others only on request, uh, please give your inputs. Thank you very much. Swapni. Thank you very much, sir. And uh, we now hand over the proceedings to Dr. Rujudha Mehta. What are you, ma'am? Good morning, everyone. On behalf of the Bombay Orthopedic Society, I wish every teacher, each and every teacher on this panel and who is tuned in with us a very, very happy Teacher's Day. I think trauma is one of the um, first subjects and closest to all our hearts. And uh, you know, the learning in trauma really never stops. So it couldn't have been more opportune that we have this uh, topic today. And the theme for the master series, as all of you know, is what changed the game in a particular subject. And I am just so happy to see both the conveners who have like years and years and volumes of experience behind them, Dr. Chandak sir and uh, Dr. Shakir Bhai, who have really nailed it by choosing four key concepts and uh, what really changed over the last uh, few decades in the way trauma is now practiced in day-to-day -day life. So without much ado, I hand over the proceedings to Dr. Chandak sir. I request all delegates to please keep on uh, sending in your questions on the live YouTube channel, but make sure you address the particular person on uh, whose lecture you wish to ask the question to. And uh, please interact freely because this is a topic close to all our hearts. Dr. Chandak sir and Shakir bhai, uh, please take over. Good morning, friends. Uh, very happy Teachers Day to all and respect to all my teachers. Uh, we have a wonderful topic today, Game Changers in Orthopedics. Let us learn from all our teachers and faculty members how they imbibe the various revolutionizing concept in the um, events in orthopedic trauma. So let us begin our session. The first session is on VAC. So there are four modules. The first module is on VAC. Second is on syndesmosis, evolution in concept. Third module is lateral wall concept, evolution, uh, and the concept itself. Fourth is on the internal fixation. So let us begin with the uh, first uh, module. And Dr. Shakir Bhai, if you can, uh, um, Dr. Shakir, you are there. Yeah, please unmute yourself, Shakir. You are muted, Shakir, sir. So let, so let us begin the first session uh, on VAC. The first lecture is none other than Dr. Vikas Agashe, VAC in infected wounds. Sometimes they are internet connection problems will happen that way. Good morning, everyone. We need to raise on the dais and my friends. That can be extremely useful in such widely infected wounds. I start with the case. A 31-year-old man presented on 14th post-injury day in a in septic condition. 
You can see it had a marked swelling of the forearm, arm, and anterior chest wall. Also had scrotal and penile edema. There was mini vacancy too, and there was also a small incision on the dorsal side of forearm. The radial pulses were felt, finger movements were okay. And this is just a history that I am tracing. He had a fall on the road from scooter. His pain decreased with painkillers and ice. And all of a sudden, on fifth day, the pain increased. <coughs> Consulted an orthopedic surgeon who picked up a fracture of the recovery. He gave him a scotch cast plaster. His pain increased tremendously. Therefore, it was univalve by the surgeon. The pain was unbearable, so he changed the doctor who bypassed the plaster, but still the pain persisted. His fingers became dusky, his sensations reduced, so a working diagnosis of compartment syndrome was made. And the blood parameter was 25,000. A compartment release was done by the second surgeon and he noted that there was a large abscess. You can see here, the photo and uh, video is shared by the operating surgeon and it's a huge abscess in the forearm and arm. Next day, his counts increased to 52. The culture after 48 hours turned out to be streptococcus. He was started on IV antibiotics and he was planned for ED fragment. This is him on 10th post-operative day. And the surgeon decided to close this wound because he felt the wound was quite okay. After three days, the pain was unbearable, which increased proximally also and developed. He had severe pain in the chest and arm as well as the entire limb. The MRI that was done at that time showed extensive cellulitis and fasciitis of shoulder, arm, elbow, and forearm, and extensive edematous changes in the muscles of arm and shoulder, suggestive of pyomyositis. So this was classically fitting into pyomyositis. So this is when he presented to us. At presentation, his counts were 28,000, and he was in extreme pain, agonizing pain. With that, we decided to explore him immediately. So this is him at 3 a.m., on 15th day, you can see there is a vascular bundle just exposed to a cover with a sheath. So when we explored, several muscles were found necrotic. The brachial is here, long head of biceps, which you can see here, the medial intermuscular septum here. We retracted, excised the medial intermuscular septum and saw the, uh, the long head of triceps also necrotic. The fascia on the lateral aspect of the arm was necrotic. Uh, after a bit of abduction, you could see that this is the deltoid, which is necrotic. We retracted pectoralis major and found pectoralis minor to be necrotic. So all in all, most of the muscles of arm and um, some muscle of uh, chest were found necrotic. After this aggressive debridement, he was very comfortable next day, except had slight pain on the chest wall. His counts had high increased to 43,000, which is quite common in most of the infected cases. The culture turned out to be acinetobacter resistant to all except minocycline, and so he was started on minocycline. Seventeenth day, the wound appeared a bit better, so we planned for a vac. Now, challenges would be. There was slough and necrotic tissue, still slough and necrotic tissue, and generally a well debride wound is needed for putting in vac. And this appeared to be quite difficult to remove. Also, the vascular bundle was exposed, and this large wound would ooze so much with vac that we have had cases who have gone in hypotension. So these were the challenges. Now we put bactigras over the uh, the vascular bundle as a contact wound contact layer and we used VAC in still as well as VAC Veraflow cleanse choice dressing which is extremely useful in such cases. So the bactigras was used over that was a burn mesh and then 
we use one large vera flow foam, which is, uh, or you can see there are plenty of holes there, which become very, very useful in such cases. So with a view of reducing fluid and blood loss in such a large wound, we kept the pressure at 75, though the company personally kept on telling us, no, no, sir, company says it should be one minus 125. But obviously, he doesn't, he didn't have to manage the post operative So from 18 to 28 days, he used a lot. And his hemoglobin kept dropping in spite of perfusion. But he was still not very comfortable. Pain was around 10 by 4 by 10. Then we again explored him. We, the muscles were quite edematous. In fact, here you can see there is a fluid in, inside the brachioradialis, which we have drained. So next day, patient said, I'm, I have not slept whole night. So we were started wondering what to do. Should we reduce the pressure or redebrive urgently or increase painkillers? We really didn't know. And all of a sudden, it struck me that possibly the instilled fluid is not getting adequately drained. That's why the muscles were edematous. That's why there was fluid inside the brachioradialis. And that is why probably the company person kept saying that company advises minus 125. So we just did that. And within 15 minutes, the patient said, oh, I'm quite comfortable, sir. We must thank Mr. Rohan, which is the company representative. Then he never looked back. The wound improved. We did partial closure. After four days, the counts decreased. This is a very good wound after just first whack after partial closure. When we closed the wound partially for the remaining areas, we did split thickness graft. This is after one, one and a half months, and this is at two months, he has a decent elbow flexion and it is certainly improving every day. So to conclude, back can be a game changer in infected wounds, but it is not a substitute for radical debridement. Occasionally, presence of pus, slough or non-viable tissues, which cannot be removed easily, is a challenging situation. And in that case, VAC instill and VAC Vera flow cleanse would be very, very useful. Thank you very much, friends. Thank you very much. Uh, the next lecture would be by Dr. Vari Dalta, VAC evolution in technique and indications. Good morning, everybody. I'm Dr. Varid Altaf. I'm from Sancheti Hospital, Pune. And I'm going to talk on VACIS evolution and its technique to be used in open injuries. At the outset, I'd like to thank this initiative by Bombay Orthopedic Society and giving me a chance to talk on this particular topic. So I'll quickly share my screen. So all of us know the, the, the evolution of VAC has, has recently changed in, in past, maybe I would say a, a decade now. And it's, it's been very widely and very effectively being used in various different scenarios, apart from open injuries and also in chronic neglected uh, wounds. So in open injuries, basically the goals of treatment is to convert an open infected fracture into a closed non-infected fracture, which, which may take a lot of time, but that is what the goal should be before we go in for any internal fixation. So a VAC definitely helps in the process of converting of this open fracture into a closed non-infected fracture. So quickly going to the introduction, as we know that VAC has revolutionized the current wound management. It is used in acute as well as chronic wounds. There's a lot of literature on VAC which is available and it has it has a very good widespread use all around in various different different scenarios. So currently we will just deal with the open injuries. 
So a compound fractures along with the extensive soft tissue losses is a challenge for an every orthopedic surgeon. All of us know that. They need multiple surgeries. They need plastic surgeries. They, the cost is always an issue. And the aim is to not only cover the exposed bone, but also to finally achieve the union because both the things should go simultaneously. I would, I would, I would begin with this statement rather that that negative pressure wound therapy is not an alternative to any debridement. It is, the debridement is definitely a key for any open fractures. The wax therapy may aid to get, you know, to get a good bed later on, but but that is not an if, a alternative to debridement. That means you don't debride and just put a wax on an infected wound and assume or, or you know think that it will uh, do some miracles, but that is that is not going to happen. The mechanism is a macro strain and a micro strain. The macro strain is something like what happens in shown in this picture. It it stabilizes the wound, pulls the edges together, and you know helps to decrease the edema peri in the peri wound, and the defect becomes sort of smaller in size. That is one advantage. And micro strain is what acts as a cellular level, which has been proved in vivo and vitro uh, that you know there is stimulation of the granulocytes. The, at the cellular activity and which helps in you know tissue formation granulation tissue formation so the indications are acute wounds chronic wounds subacute wounds burns you know over the flaps grafts diabetic wounds pressure ulcers so there's a wide spectrum of indications and which is really helpful in most of the cases so quickly coming to our topic is that in open fractures so whenever we see an open fracture we we what we need to assess before you know before we do anything is is to quickly see the degree of community contamination how much contamination it is how much is the periosteal stripping the time since arrival associated injuries and comorbid conditions so uh, all these factors play a very important role in the overall management of that particular limb and of that particular patient so like if this is a 70 years old male a diabetic a crush injury of the lower third so you 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 know whenever you see this patient something like this and you you, you come to know that he's diabetic we uh, we kind of get on the back foot you know uh, what to do so the associated conditions definitely have a role to play and a lower third tibia fracture something like this again where if it's a watershed zone where the vascularity is less is 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 it it's a difficult side to get a union so we quickly did a quick debridement we uh, but stabilized this with an ankle spanning external fixator and and at the one week you can see there's there's a marginal necrosis of this flap occurring so uh, I, at this point of time the thought process was whether to wait or whether to go ahead and um, uh, you know debride it so there, there's always a dilemma at and when you see something like this but we decided to uh, to debride it again uh, remove whatever is a suspicious tissue and then uh, did a quickly did a graft and subsequently a wax therapy was was put on this patient and that is uh, a fibula nail was done i think a fibula nail does a very important role in such kind of a lower third injuries you know it, it stabilizes the tibial fracture as well and this had healed very nicely in an external fixator so this patient this is at 4 months this patient is So he had a decent range of motion. He was walking full weight bearing subsequently with a stick support and, and that, that fracture healed. An injury like this, a young male, a high velocity injury. This is a 3B. You can see periosteal stripping in this area. And uh, uh, again, thorough debridement and <coughs> spanning external fixator, trying to align it in the best possible way you can. It's like a delta frame kind of a thing, and then after putting an fixator, you you you, you see uh, this is the tissue, this is the condition. So you the, the there's a stripping of periosteum already in that area we know, and um, and there is a big defect in the skin and soft tissues. So we all know that the back cannot be put on a on a exposed periosteum on a thick periosteum, uh, which is which is exposed. So in this situation, what we primarily did was we uh, explored, we took out a hemisoleus uh, flap 
Uh, and then we uh, rotated that flap and covered that defect and that was covered with a skin graft. And uh, subsequently a VAC therapy was put. And so primary, whenever we see wounds like that, a primary flap is also uh, very, very helpful in such situations. And uh, that is how it looked and that's how it was after the flap had settled well and it was very quickly converted into an interlocking nail. Uh, after removing, you know, at three weeks, we could manage to do that. <coughs> this is again a common injury, a traumatic uh, near total amputation of the ankle joint, near the ankle joint. So this was again, you know, deprived initially, tendon repair, a microvascular repair was done in this case. And uh, fortunately, <coughs> we, could, we could get a good vascularity after the surgery. And then all that circumferential skin loss had got necrotic, which was debrided, and this was after a week of back therapy, how it looked. And that's how it is at two weeks, it was grafted, and that was that was how he's walking. Probably we are seeing maybe doing an ankle fusion or some tendon transfer in this patient in, in the near future. So one of the evolutions, since I have to talk about evolution, is, is a VAC Veraflow therapy, which is which is installation of normal saline along with the process of this negative pressure wound therapy, which which is a big, uh, big I must say, a change in this uh, treatment, and uh, which is very helpful when we are seeing some uh, chronic wounds which are not healing. So most of the times it is used in open fractures as well as degloving injuries. So whenever we are seeing degloving injuries, there is there is less of bony injuries, but more of soft tissue injuries. And we have to anticipate the soft tissue loss, which is going to happen in the near future. Watch for sudden deterioration in the general condition, like shock sepsis. You know, sometimes these patients may surprise you looking fine one day and next day you are they are, they are absolutely, you know, critically uh, uh, sick in the ICU. So runover injury, you can see the amount of degloving in the arm. It was like a side sweep injury. There was an intraarticular fracture of the distal humerus. Gross ligamentous instability. So <clears throat> the x-ray, not very bad, but yeah, comminuted fracture of the distal end of the humerus. So we did a elbow spanning ex -fix external fixator, uh, aligned the bone, did some uh, uh, ligament repair with anchor sutures, the collateral ligaments. And that's how it looked eventually. And that is, we did a skin grafting. And at three months, the bone started settling down and at this is at six months he had a decent range of motion and we had posted him for for elbow arthrolysis eventually so he had he had he had probably a reasonably functional range of motion here again this is a runover injury a young girl circumferential primarily interlocking nail negative pressure wound therapy and that is how it healed. This is at four months how she showed. When because of the lockdown, she could not come to follow up and she had to show. The other evolution in VAC is the clean's choice wound, which is, uh, which is a perforated foam kind of a thing which can be used and in, in a chronic infected wounds where you, know, uh, you expect some desluffing to happen at the same time. So... Uh, we cannot talk about this in detail, but this is another evolution which has happened. This was again a, a degloving injury. You can see the whole skin, the tire marks are there of the truck. It was the limb had got under the truck. So we had to think whether we remove the skin, should we put the graft from the removed skin or do an autologous graft or donor site or skin bank, X-fix or not, so a lot of things has happened. So we did a radical debridement, uh, excised the whole skin, did a skeletal stabilization, negative pressure wound therapy, a couple of therapies, then we did a grafting, and at two months, this thing whole thing had healed. And this is the video which had, he had sent me during the walk. Now lockdown, he had started walking, climbing up the stairs. Thank you very much. Thank you, Varit for a wonderful exposition on VAC evolution. Uh, the next is a case uh, discussion from Dr. Jawahar Jetfa. We invite Dr. Jawahar Jetfa. Kindly share your screen, sir.
Okay, now my voice is clear? Yes, sir, we can hear you. Yes. So thank you very much for inviting me and giving this opportunity, specifically all the organizers. I have nothing to disclaim about my point of VAC cases is that I have found there is no use of VAC machine. So basically how you can get a wound healing without VAC machine, but with the sponge. Has anybody tried VAC dressing without machine or without sponge? And the point is that have you noticed that the even if the dressing is not airtight, wound heals. There are large defects where you are not able to get a negative pressure, but still it heals. What is the point? So why sponge is inevitable part in all brands of wet machines? Whichever the brand you pick up, there will be always a sponge. And if the sponge is so important, it works. And if the sponge is not important, then why it should not suck through the ghost pieces only? Why we need that sponge? So the point is very clear. There is something about that sponge which gives us this wood healing so fast. So it is possible to heal wounds without vacuum by using only the sponge and not the negative pressure. So let me go through some of the cases. It's a compound injury which was treated by a medial plate and it went into infection where I tried to put some sponge and tried to get out of this exudate but was not successful. So I went in and opened up and debrided everything including the exposed implant, everything which has been cleaned. And thereafter again, I started with the sponge only and this is how started giving a good results. I did secondary suturing of that defect and ultimately it healed. So second case is of tendoachillus. We all know we are having number of problems with the posterior wound when we go with the repair of the Achilles tendon. And with the wound disease and you try to go with the spawn dressing and somehow gradually everything settles and you are able to do secondary closure. And with the sponge only, I could go with a complete healing there was no need of wet machine. This is another case of unhealthy skin, a proximal 130 BR. It was fixed with the endonail, very good union had occurred, but the distal end, entry end of the lateral endonail got some infection where I need to go in and do a complete thorough debridement till the end, which I found necrotic tissue. With a sponge at that level, it was completely healed. One more case is of a compound dislocation fracture of the distal filings. It was treated like this and thereafter there was a pouring pass at this point. So I debrided it, put a very small portion of sponge and gradually it went into complete healing with a full function of that joint. Late infection occurred in a femoral nailing, which is very common and some sinuses occurs on the lateral part of the wound. And at that also, I did some sort of a scoop and some debridement and then went on putting multiple times this sponge only and it went into complete healing. And I know this patient, it is already now three years and there was no recurrence of sinus. There's a compound multifragmentary tibia fracture where there are two places where there was some pus discharge after this pedicle where I put all these dressings with a sponge only and look at this very carefully, that this is the last part where I just removed the sponge, which was completely dry. And there was no element of any leaking sinus. And this is how I got the complete healing of this particular case. There is a case of a diabetic foot with an amputation of the third toe, which we do at the base and we all know that it does not heal primarily. There is always some exudate. That also I could cover with a sponge only. And this was a complete healing at the end. This is the case of a compound calcaneum where it was fixed with the external fixator. And we did some couple of two or three stitches, but we found that we have to reopen it. But we always find a void 
which is at the fracture side. And this is how I recommend to use the sponge. You make it and cut it so that you can put the sponge inside of that void where the exudate is collecting, the secretions are happening. Unless you put that sponge right at the place where it is producing, and then couple of some small pieces around, and then you go with a dressing, no ointment, no other uh, you know medications locally, only the sponge, and then after some good number of ghost pieces, fluffy ghost pieces. And when you try to remove it, look at this. How much it has sucked? It has sucked so much, it is already sticking. But the important part is to go through that void and again put something into that void, some strip of a sponge and rest of the part which is healing very well, you can just put a gel on it. And thereafter, this patient was referred to uh, plastic surgery and they did a beautiful skin grafting and it was healed. This was a huge carbuncle on the back and my colleague surgeon uh, uh, excised everything with a four inches of a oval defect, which was healed with a sponge only. And it went into a beautiful healing in five weeks of total time. I also have used this sponge for a clean cases where I, we found that sometimes with a fatty lady, there is always a, some discharging some exudate postoperatively in the posterior approach of the hip, where I put primarily these strips of sponge and that beautifully it heals and there is less likelihood of a continuous aseptic serous discharge. And this is my last case, which was a very bad amputation with a lot of infection. And it was a, a late amputation with a diabetic foot. And we did debridement and we kept on putting sponge where there was a void and exudates and gradually it went into healing week after week. And wherever there was a problem, we put sponge there only where there is an exudate. And at the end, it goes with a very good primary healing. And thereafter, we tried to put the STG. Even after STG, there were two points where again, some sort of a collection started. On that, again, we put some small sponge. And at the end, it went for a complete healing. So a large exudating wound, which is dressed by a sponge, which goes completely healed with this sponge only technique. So friends, my point is that it becomes less expensive when you use only the sponge available in that kit. I hope you'll be able to understand this particular modality, but very important point is that that sponge should be of a medical grade. It is not all the sponge which can work like this, but some of the colleagues have already commented me on my YouTube that they have found some other sponge which is also available in market, which is autoclavable. This sponge is autoclavable. It does not spoil even if you do multiple autoclaving. So I thank you very much for this uh, opportunity and I hope all you try this and share your cases with me. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much, uh, Jetwa, sir. At the end, we'll be having a discussion. So next, I'll be presenting on use of hydro debridement along with VAC. Let me share my screen, sir. Just a minute. I'll be presenting on negative pressure wound therapy in complex open injuries along with the principle of hydro debridement. So we have a lot of these injuries, oh my God, injuries, mud impregnated, runover injuries, which are difficult to manage and difficult to uh, debride as well. So this was the X-ray of that patient, almost radiologically completely dissociated midfoot. Uh, our surgical goals in this cases are managed by use of IV antibiotics, a good debridement, stabilization, either x fix or minimum covered internal fixation, delayed or primary wound cover, and then use of negative pressure wound therapy along with. In managing mud impregnated runover wound, 
this combination of hydrodebridement and vac are great assets so this is the video of hydrodebridement how it works so it it works by a principle of of uh, injected saline at a speed and gradually this is the 45 degree angle brush which just removes the layer of mud which is impregnated over the tissue and debrides the necrotic slough and necrotic tissue only you can see even near the vessel it, it just removes a thin layer of that uh, slough mud etc uh, in this case coming to this case so so the whole tissues are debrided you can run it over the soft tissues avoid running on a bone on the bone we have to scrape with knife and curette so this is in short how it works this is after one negative pressure wound therapy and compartment release in that crushed foot and completely covering the foot with a negative pressure wound therapy this is after further debridement and this is actually the machine where we use um, a pressure uh, from 0 to 10 we can use it at 10 when we want to debride large amount of tissue at a pressure this is after the debridement and complete uh, foot shortened stabilized and a negative pressure wound therapy given this is after the microvascular flap given at around 20 days from the injury and uh, this after that the foam is on a patient is rested on a foam to avoid that heel pressure necrosis etc this is the final result giving us most respectful satisfied response from the patient so back adjunct along with hydrodebridement can work in badly contaminated cases the most important thing here would be a good debridement next in the series Uh, I request Dr. Ashish Padnis to kindly present his cases, and after his case, we'll be having discussion on the VAC module. Ashish, if you can share your screen, please. Yes, thank you, sir. Thank you very much, and I would like to thank Dr. Chandak and Dr. Shakir Kapadia for having asked me to share our uh, experience with use of VAC in situations where the implants are exposed, and we all know that this is not a very happy situation for an orthopedic surgeon. but just to uh, give you an example there are certain situations where we are faced where we might be able we might be forced to use ex an exercise such an option uh, another example of a side swipe injury which uh, uh, resulted in a lot of soft tissue damage a bad fracture of the forearm and exposed elbow joint with a lot of muscle contusion we decided on limb salvage the limb was salvaged initially and a provisional fixation was done we let the soft tissues sort of commit and uh, once we were certain that the limb has survived decided to proceed with a fixation and a flap cover at the second stage so first uh, the the orthopedic part or the bone work was done we fixed it with internal fixation and then also at the same time the plastic surgeons were involved who felt that the tissues were still edematous and uh, the muscles had not committed yet whether they were going to sort of you know uh, be contused and uh, accept the flap very easily and hence it was decided at that stage that they would not do the flap at the same sitting so this was a situation in which the the plate of the radius was going to be exposed through the wound and therefore we just tagged certain tissues on top and put a vac dressing for another 2 to 3 days till the time the muscles committed at the second stage uh, debridement with a local rotation flap and a skin grafting was done and uh, this resulted in healing it resulted in a slight amount of mal union this case is still ongoing but the bones have healed without any evidence of any infection and we were able to retain the implants the other scenario where we are faced uh, not so commonly but it is a uh, situation that we can find ourselves in especially in pylon fractures or distal tibial fractures we can said see that this is a comminuted distal tibial uh, uh, fracture this necessitated us to uh, use a dual approach so we used a plate on the fibula a posterior posterior plate and an anterior lateral uh, approach on an anterior lateral plate what happened was these tissues were quite edematous towards the end of the surgery resulting in a tight closure in spite of us having given adequate space in between these two incisions 
and uh, the closure was too tight. So we had to leave the wound open, which meant that the plates on the posterior aspect and the lateral aspect could be open. And hence we decided to primarily put a wag dressing on. So that would keep the environment sterile. That would sort of prevent contamination of the wound. And we can visit the room, uh, wound again for a secondary closure or a secondary debridement, uh, secondary closure. I don't have clinical photos of the WAC, but you can see on the X-rays that there is a the, the tubing of the WAC and the sponge which is uh, the shadow of the sponge which is seen. At the second stage, when the edema was less, we attempted a closure, but because the swelling was there, the plastic surgeons decided to do a skin grafting. The skin graft eventually healed, and this is the uh, X-ray of the patient at about a six-month follow-up, and that's the status of the wound. So again, in this situation, because we could keep a sort of a a sterile environment, prevent the contamination, we could have the cushion of going in for a delayed closure or a secondary closure. Uh, so this is a, a patient who presented to us at the height of the pandemic, another comminuted fracture or a multifragmentary fracture of the distal tibia, where we could not nail it. She's a poorly controlled elderly, poorly controlled diabetic elderly lady, where uh, there was an issue with the distal vascularity as well. Uh, we did a MIPO, with, uh, did this fixation through some other incisions. However, at two to three weeks, uh, this patient sent us this picture from her residence. So we called her in the OPD. Uh, we debrided her on the first stage. We were not certain whether the infection has already been settled, but we couldn't leave the wound open like this. And hence, we decided to put a wag dressing, await the cultures, uh, get the diabetes under control within the next two to three days uh, so that the plastic surgeons could proceed with a local rotation flap uh, eventually, the flap settled, we could retain the implants, and uh, she proceeded on to function well. Uh, I do not have further x-rays because she hasn't followed up, but this is the video which she has sent in last week. Uh, she would eventually come for a follow-up whenever uh, they are, you know, they can come for a follow-up. The last situation, uh, as trauma surgeons, we don't uh, encounter, but in our department, uh, there's a big spine department. So this is a slide which I have borrowed from my spine uh, surgery colleague. Uh, this is again a traumatic paraparesis uh, due to an osteoporotic wedge compression, uh, osteoporotic fracture of uh, this dorsal lumbar junction, where extensive fixation was done along with the cement augmentation and the cage construct. Now in this situation, unfortunately at three weeks, the wound started leaking and there was evidence of a slight amount of infection where the spine surgeons went in and did a radical debridement and resulting in the implants which are exposed. Now, these are the implants which, again, you could not uh, afford to take it out because of the uh, nature of the surgery. And hence, they decided to proceed with the VAC application and eventually, uh, secondarily, the wound went on to heal. So therefore, I think in our limited experience, what we could sort of, you know, gain from this was it can help us avoid repeated dressing, help minimize the contamination by opening the dressings again and again. And it helped us by little time, though it is not advisable to use a vac to delay the cover. So you should try and do a cover as early as possible. But in the interim, you can use a vac and it will help salvage you know, the situation, especially when debridement and internal and implant retention is desirable. Thank you. Thank you, Ashish, for your wonderful cases. Uh, we'll have a discussion on the VAC module now. Um, any questions, uh, Harjot, on to the uh, YouTube loop? So on YouTube, uh, there are questions for Dr. Jawahar Jetfa, sir, Vari, sir, and you also. So first, I would like to request Dr. Jawahar Jetwa, sir, to answer the query. Uh, the query is on how does he sterilize the VAC uh, sponge, where to get the medical grade sponge, and can it be reused? The answer is very clear. Whatever the kit which we are using, which is provided by the company, we discard all other tubes and other things. We just use that piece of sponge. And that is a medical spray phone. It is a big piece. So you use it as per the requirement because first time it is sterile one. Now, whichever is the left part of that piece, you can put it into your regular autoclaving and it can be used. Naturally, you cannot use the one which has already been used. You have to discard it completely as a medical vest. But rest of the thing which is clean, so first time you try to take all aseptic precautions and try to see that whichever is required you use 
rest of the part you keep it in a clean drum and it can be autoclave very well as we are autoclaving our tracing materials thank you sir the doctor uh, varish sir question for you uh, is there any experience with local indian systems vac uh, machines okay <clears throat> yeah i think uh, there are number of companies which are making this vac uh, device now initially i think it was started by by the kci the 3m kci which it is now Uh, but uh, now there are multiple companies which are providing it at a very i think lesser rate than the uh, kci vac which which is um, widely used so I, uh, there there are many companies yeah if we look into there some dispo vac dmk there are many companies if we look into the market they'll get um, get to know about the indian manufacturers of the vac which are i think equally effective uh, as the kci vac thank you sir Yeah. Chandak sir, question for yeah. you. Uh, is this the saline um, injector or uh, for hydro wash that you use? Is it a separate device and uh, just uh, a separate machine? And uh, how do you uh, use for angle? There is pre-built pre-built angle in the device. Yeah. So uh, thanks, Arjun. Uh, this is a separate machine known as Varsa Jet. It's a specific machine which. Uh, Runs and injects saline. It is not actually injecting. It is a fine brush and vacuum both combined together. And uh, this uh, uh, is a separate machine altogether. The hand pieces are in available in different angles. It can be straight. It can be angled. It can be forty-five degree angled. They are available at separate hand pieces. They are all disposable sets which are available. Do you use in, do you use them in other cases also or only in debridement for? So it, it can be used for debridement of infected tissues, infected non-unions. It can be in, for infected slough removal. So it has various applications. The best use is in acute debridement of uh, traumatic wounds. There is a uh, question for Doctor Parni, sir. Yeah. Uh, sir, uh, for exposed implants, uh, you said that you, we can buy some time with a wax dressing. So, how to judge whether it is suitable for flap cover, any cultures, or any pre workup? Because risk of infection is always there. Yes. So, buy some time. What I meant was there are. I mean, this there was this diabetic lady. Second, the first patient was a, a polytrauma where the situation was such that you know all the, the he had lost his common extensor origin, all the extensor muscles of the forearm, and uh, he required a repetitive debridements. So till then you couldn't keep on opening the dressing in the ward. In the to make sure that the, whether there is an infection or no, you can wait for about twenty four to forty eight hours for the cultures to come. But uh, you know the most often. uh exposed implant in orthopedics means that the implant has to come out and uh, you know some other modality of fixation has to be done but this is on a very specific uh, implants which cannot cannot come out either they are in a early post op period like the first 2 to 4 weeks where you can attempt an implant retention before the biofilm sort of you know starts setting in and secondly as i said uh, in the spine cases where uh, they couldn't take the implant out because it would mean rendering the whole spine uh, unstable Thank you, sir. So, is there any role of silver colloidal spray or silver dressings for exposed implant? So, our uh, plastic surgeons uh, they use a lot of silver because they say that silver has uh, these antiseptic and antibiotic uh, properties. So, silver stream, uh, silver impregnated dressings, they are more so in use nowadays. But uh, I wouldn't say that you know you should form that as the basis to manage exposed implants. Say like the treatment of exposed implant is to get a soft tissue cover as early as possible. But at the same time, you have to render the uh, environment sterile by whichever means. Uh, you can use stimulant. You can use a debridement. Remove the screws. You know, exchange them for some new implants or uh, whatever. Yeah. Thank you, Ashish. Uh, Agashi sir, uh, in cases of in Infected non-union. When we put a vac machine, so you always keep pressure on one twenty-five, or you have initial less pressure to avoid the chance of a lot of sucking. You are muted, sir. You are muted, sir. Again, you are muted. Sorry, you are. Uh, you will have to unmute yourself. Yeah. Generally, if the area 
exposed is significant, one has to, the bleeding can be significant with VAC. So that is why I often keep it on a lower side, say minus 75. However, when you are doing an installation, then it is always best to keep it at one minus 125. Otherwise, the fluid accumulation will be there and there will be more problems as seen in my case. So, a standard vac, you can reduce. The granulation tissue formation is best at minus 125. However, you could use it at a lower thing, a lower pressure in case of extensive wounds. In still, you must keep it at minus 125. Thank you, Thank you very much. Uh, G.S. Kulkandi, sir, if I can ask your inputs on use of vac in acute uh, traumatic compound fractures. Yeah, yes, mute sir. Yeah, GS Kulkarni, sir. Kulkarni, sir, if you can hear us. Sir, your, your use of VAC in acute open compound injuries. Okay. Yeah. Sir, uh, sir your inputs on VAC, Kulkarni, sir. G.S. Kulkandi, sir, your inputs on VAC in acute compound fractures? I think some... Uh, sir, we can hear you, sir. Kulkandi, sir, we can hear you. We can hear you, sir. I think uh, voice is not getting. Any other uh, questions on YouTube, uh, Arjun? So, uh, meanwhile, may I ask a question? Uh, yeah, please, Sanjandak, please. Sir, yeah, please. To all the... Uh, I think panelists here and yourself also. If I were to may draw a simile and say that in the um, management of open wounds, uh, uh, especially post-traumatic, where do you place VAC versus flap cover versus debridement in terms of percentage? Rupay mein kitne aane? You know, as a game changer. If you had to qualify VAC, because that is our concept that this really changed the game. So how did it change the game? vis-a-vis -vis these two things. Right. I think Agash sir would be answering this question. Hmm. Okay. VAC optimizes wound very well, makes it more useful for some kind of skin cover. Occasionally, you may get away without formal plastic surgery procedures. The plastic surgery level may go down, like from flap, you can come down to split thickness graft. But the most important thing is debridement. The topmost is debridement. It is 80% your debridement. Then is your VAC, which will optimize your wound for either direct closure, uh, secondary healing, split thickness graft, or some kind of flap. If you are talking of vital structures, if the vital structures are exposed like muscles, tendons, no, uh, sorry, tendons, nerves, uh, hardware, fracture site, you must have a flap. Yeah. VAC just helps you to make your bed better for this flap. Thank you, sir. Tanna, sir, raised the hand. Uh, Tanna, sir, you wanted to comment on VAC. Uh, I, think, I think her question was in infection. What is the percentage? I would put it 100% is debriment. 100% yes. is debriment. There is hardly any role of VAC for infection. VAC is to get a new tissue. So after the infection is controlled, then the VAC comes into the picture. Uh, a question Dr. for uh, Dr. Jawar. Yeah, please. Ajinder, yeah, yeah, I please. have a question for Dr. Jawar. Yeah, please. I really was quite impressed by your talk on the sponge. I would just want to know what is your thought process that why the sponge works without the suction? The sponge has its own, own, own property of, you know, uh, surface tension and sucking it. And once you see after 48 hours, it becomes almost five, six times heavier. So it is basically that capillary action which helps VAC machine to get the excess of exudate. The only advantage of the sponge is that you can put into the void. 
the natural available kit will not allow the sponge to go into the void where we want to put here you have an advantage of putting it to depth and once you see and experience it you will know that it may take 24 hours or 48 hours or later maybe 3 4 hours or 3 4 days but it works very well and the other aspect is it has got a much more capillary uh, action than only uh, gauze pieces and that's how it works and it requires a different thickness is that the actual mechanical suction is the one which improves uh, and 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 depending on the exudate you can increase or decrease the thickness of that sponge it's a very small wound then you put a thinner and very big wound you put a real thick available sheet and that will work very well yes dr kulkarni sir wanted to comment and that dr mohanty sir mohanty sir yes uh see the recent advances in the open fractures are three number one is of course debridement and debridement and debridement as uh, dilip and uh, agashe has stress that is number one number two is again very important equally important is stabilization of the fracture fragment from day one to the last day of healing so stabilization by external fixator is not is good of course external fixator is necessary but then in very comminuted and contaminated cases after debridement we put on an antibiotic rod a rod and plate or a rod and external fixator is a very excellent method of stabilization it stabilizes almost as if you have done internal fixation the third the uh, recent advance is close the wound as early as possible if you are very confident of thorough debridement do the full closure if possible on day 1 you can do day 1 fix and flap or you can do, do day 1 uh, fix and uh, skin graft but if there if you are not doubtful then fourth tip is Uh, the fact has a definite role if you are very doubtful about your debridement if you are expecting infection to occur the the fact vac itself will not only drain the uh, this and reduce the infection rate but it also increase the granulation tissue and therefore thereby you can uh, cover the skin as early as possible these are the three principles one debridement to uh, stabilization and three skin closure as early as possible thank you very much sir dr uh, mohanty you wanted to ask question and yeah. after that we we'll begin next session yeah uh, good morning uh, just uh, wanted to ask that uh, to all the speakers what is <coughs> your experience of using back in compound joint injuries you know compound joint injuries has been uh, you know very uh, Difficult to manage. There are a lot of oozing goes on. Have you used in joint compound joint injuries? And number two, any compound uh, replacement surgeries. Uh, some people use it. I have seen, but uh, what is the experience of all these speakers? Thank you. Agashi sir, you wanted to answer that question. Yeah. No. Uh, most important is covering a good, having a good flap cover for the joint as early as possible. So again, a good debridement. and flap as early as possible otherwise they'll form a fistula uh, sir his and, uh, sir his question was for uh, implanted total joint in relation to a implanted total joint no as well as primary compound joints uh, also sir primary sir. compound joint injuries so as regards primary compound joint injuries this and as as regards exposed joints again the cause is obviously infection in the total joint arthroplasty so so unless that is addressed there is no point in putting a vac so i have used vac in one infection where there was some osteomyelitic process underneath the tibial uh, component which i excised excessively put a vac and then could close but the important thing is you can't keep it open for a long time There is no point in continuing vac for days together. You must be able to achieve cover in say three four days time. 
Thank you very much, sir, on those inputs. And uh, this was a wonderful session. Now uh, we'll be beginning with the next session. And that uh, the next session is a very interesting one. Syndesmosis, throughout our life, we keep on learning new things. And that is always a dilemma when we face a patient uh, with a syndesmotic injury on table. So may, uh, in this session, the faculties are Dr. Sangeet Gawade, Dr. Didi Tanna, sir. And then we'll be having cases on syndesmosis from Dr. Abhishek Kini and Dr. Pradeep Muno. May I invite... Sorry. Yeah, please, Arujita, you uh, want to... uh, Before we go on to the next session, I thank all the speakers of the first session. I think they've really raised very, very important uh, practical aspects of VAC. And there are still a lot of uh, questions coming on the YouTube. So I request the faculty to please log in there and answer them there for our audience live. And the rest of y'all to please stay on if you can for the other sessions. Chandak sir, very well done. And at the end of the whole uh, master series, I will request both you and Shakir Bhai to give us one one take home message from each session. Right. Thank you so much. Uh, so we are now ready for the next session, a very interesting session on syndesmosis. And may I invite Dr. Sangeet Gavari to start his talk on evolution of syndesmosis and intraop evaluation. Go ahead, thank you. Uh, so my talk is on, one second. Yeah, please, 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 no problem. Evaluation of syndesmosis preoperatively and intraoperatively. Most of the orthopedic literature addresses syndesmosis, ligament injuries in combination with the fractures around the ankle and not as an isolated syndesmotic ligament injuries. And that is why there is a lot of confusion uh, the, regarding the fixation of syndesmosis or the fixation of the fracture. There are two types of ankle ligament injuries. One is at the lower level, that is the collateral ligament injury, and the higher is the syndesmotic injury, which is also a high ankle sprain. So this confusion has to be made clear. And in this talk, I would be covering what is the syndesmosis, what is a common injury pattern in which you can get this injury, what is a preoperative evaluation you must do, and interoperatively, how do you evaluate these uh, injuries. So what is syndesmosis? It is a complex of ligament that joins the distal fibula to the distal tibia at the level of ankle joint. And the stabilizer, static stabilizer is the incisura, that is the tibial notch for the fibula. And the depth varies in every individual. Apart from that, there are three dynamic stabilizers. These are the three ligaments, the anterior inferior tibiofibular ligament, the introsious ligament, and the posterior inferior tibiofibular ligament. So these all together gives stability to the, step, to the syndesmosis of the ankle joint. Now, where is this ligament seen? What is exactly is the location? So here is a live picture wherein uh, this is patient is in a prone position. This is his right leg. On the right side is the fibula, which is fractured here. And lower down is the heel. This is a posterolateral approach. And you can see here uh, the position has changed. So that is the ligament which is seen here. So that is the posterior inferior tibiofibular ligament, which Whenever there is an injury to that, it usually avulses the posterolateral corner of the fibula, and that is the Volkmann's tubercle. So this injury, along with the fracture, displaces the fibula from the incisura. So here, the treatment is not fixing the fibula by a syndesmotic screw. The treatment is reducing that tubercle, the posterolateral corner of tibia, and fixing it with uh, a fixation will reduce 
the fibula <laughs> in its normal location in, in its normal incisura so like this we have a second ligament which is anterior the anterior inferior tibio fibular ligament its contribution is almost 35% towards the stability of the syndesmosis and similar is a fracture on the anterior side now this is that fra fracture which usually occurs avulsing that fragment to uh, with the attached ligament that is the anterior inferior tibio fibular ligament so that is what you can see here it is the weakest ligament out of all ankle ligaments and most common and it is often missed uh, whenever you have these patient with ankle sprains so that is the caput tubercle which avulses anteriorly when you have this ligament injury second is the common injury pattern what is seen apart from these fractures of the three malleoli there could be a rupture of the whole syndesmosis uh, the tibio fibular ligament or it could be a pure ankle dislocation in which you can get these type of injury the current classification is imperfect in predicting syndesmotic stability however clinically you can evaluate these when they have uh, ichymosis or uh, anterolateral pain and these are the injury patterns which are uh, likely to have also associated syndesmotic injury the pronation and the supination external rotation and the pronation abduction fractures the clinical evaluation can be done by three four test i'll uh, complete them the tibio fibular squeeze test wherein you squeeze the fibula with the palm at the upper level and the pain will be elicited on the anterolateral side of the ankle uh, this is almost 88% specific specific for the syndesmotic uh, ligament injury the second test is a dorsiflexion external rotation stress test where you stress the foot by dorsiflexing it that will elicit a pain on the anterolateral side and this has a sensitivity of 71% another test is the fibular translation where you can translate the lateral malleolus anteriorly and posteriorly and usually there is a translation of 2 to 3 mm if you have pain if there is a abnormal translation always compare it with opposite side and then uh, diagnose that as a injury cross leg test where you apply a pressure on the medial side of the t of the knee in this figure 4 position it reproduces the pain on the anterolateral part of the ankle the last test is a standing pivot test wherein you make the patient stand on the symptomatic foot and ask him to externally pivot the other leg and the trunk and you can elicit a pain on the anterolateral side of the ankle similarly you can tape the tibia and fibula just above the ankle and ask the patient to walk and on that and also you can do a pivot test again so in these two if there is a significant reduction in the pain it is almost diagnostic of the uh, this dynamic test is almost diagnostic of a syndesmotic injury but don't depend on a single test because it is not accurate so it is recommended you should depend on combination of two or three tests to diagnose it pre operatively the pre operative evaluation includes x rays and these are other tests which are important most important is in this injury almost do always do a full length leg x ray to know if there is a higher fracture and there is a complete disruption of the tibia and fibular uh, interosseous ligament that is a masino injury the pre operative radiological indicators are this tibio fibular space which has to be looked at a distance of a centimeter from the ankle joint and in a injured view you can see a abnormal opening which is more than 5 mm so this is one of the way by which you can diagnose second is a decrease in the tibio tibio fibular overlap normally there is a overlap of the fibula on the lateral side of the tibia by about 6 mm in normal view 
and one millimeter in a mortise view. In an injured uh, ankle, there will be no overlap or the tibiofibular space will open out like this. And last is the most important, that is the medial clear space. Uh, this is a normal X-ray and this is an injured X-ray and you can see the medial clear space between the talus and the medial malleolus has opened. If it has opened by more than four millimeter, again, it is a diagnostic of uh, ankle syndesmotic injury. These tests may be helpful wherein if you take the X-ray in this position, you can differentiate the ankle instability. This is the, of the same patient, a normal X-ray taken. And this is the gravity test. You can see the abnormal opening on the medial clear space and also the tibial, tibiofibular space. Weight bearing, this is a, a non-weight bearing X-ray of the ankle. Patient is made to bear weight and then we take an X-ray. You can see the talar tilt and opening of the medial clear space. And on the lateral view again, that is a fracture which could have been missed if these two X-ray would not have been taken. And also because of the abnormal talar tilt, you can see what has happened to the ankle joint. It has opened out anteriorly and it is lesser. So the joint is not congruous. So weight bearing films are also equally important. Is there any role of CT scan? Two most important views is the axial cut at the level of syndesmosis is the most important uh, investigation which can decide your management of syndesmotic injury. Also a 3D scan here, even though the posterior malleolus or uh, the posterolateral corner of the tibia is undisplaced, but you can see the tibiofibular space has opened out significantly. And in this, when you take uh, axial cuts like this, it can additionally reveal whether there is an anterior fragment, whether it is anterior and posterior, or it involves only the posterior fragment. Not only that, but what is the association of the fibula to the incisura? In the first, it is displaced anteriorly. E here in the middle one, even though there are fractures of anterior and posterior, but the fibula has remained inside the incisura. And third, is the posterior subluxation. And you can see in this film, what is the depth of the incisura? It varies in every individual. And that cut has to be taken at, uh, uh, at the level of syndesmosis to diagnose it, uh, syndesmotic injury in a CT scan. Is there a role of MRI scan when there are no bony injuries seen on a CT scan? So probably you can diagnose them as a high ankle sprain, sprains where there is a uh, ligament to the these three ligaments what we have seen the anterior or the interstitial or the posterior ligaments which can be picked up in the MRI wherein you can see the fluid coming out from the syndesmosis or, or out of the injured ligament so that is the how MRI can help us here is a case a 36 year old boy who had an ankle subluxation and this was reduced in the emergency there was no fracture higher up and again, it redislocated. So we did a CT scan and you can see what revealed is a significantly displaced fragment anteriorly, that is a cabu tubercle. So the CT scan in such situation is very helpful. And that is how we can locate that fragment. Not only that, but the relation of the fibula to the incisura. MRI in this particular case is of no use, which has been done here. It can be used when there is no bony injuries. Lastly, the intraoperative evaluation is most important. And uh, you can see here what mistake has been done. This was a undisplaced lateral malleolus fracture. It has been fixed well where the ankle looks uh, reduced. But in about two weeks time, you can see what has happened. The medial clear space has opened out. So is the tibiofibular space. So if this ankle would not have been evaluated intra-op by the test, which I'm coming to, you can lead, you can be in a disaster like this. So what are these tests which are useful? You can do indirect visualization, or you can do a direct visualization where you open anterolaterally and see the syndesmosis. First, we will cover the indirect uh, test. Now, after you have stabilized the posterior, the lateral 
and the medial malleolus then you do this test wherein the bony components of the avulsions have been stabilized and if there are no bony avulsions you can uh, uh, probably dr tanna is going to speak on this so i will not talk about this the two tests which are very important intraoperatively is the cotton's test and second is the external rotation stress test and how do we perform them this is a syndesmotic injury a hook has been passed on the lateral malleolus and you can see how much the syndesmosis is opening laterally so not only the coronal translation a sagittal translation manually can is also helpful in diagnosing a abnormal uh, or a syndesmotic injury however in the earlier case where once you have fixed all the components you can as well in that after the fixation you can use a towel clip or a bone hook and again do the same thing what we have done earlier here this is a normal syndesmosis so the syndesmosis has stabilized after you have fixed the fractures so that is about the uh, cotton test the second test which is most important is the dorsiflexion and external rotation wherein in this you can see the medial clear space and how the talus is shifting during the dorsiflexion if you see a medial clear space opening by more than 5 mm it is the most reliable method to predict the rupture and how see what as difference it has made once you stabilize with a k wire or a screw you can see how the ankle has become stable the same intraoperatively you can see on dorsiflexion the ankle is unstable and just by passing a k wire across the tibia and fibula it has remained stable so this is the uh, dorsiflexion external rotation test which you must evaluate while fixing these ankle fractures and lastly you can also do a radiological assessment where you take a talar dome view talar dome view is where you see the talus and the tibia like this with a clear space between the two and then you compare the relation of the posterior malleolus to the posterior border of the fibula by taking the opposite side x ray this is the normal view and this is the injured leg where you can see uh, there is a identical overlap of the posterior malleolus on the lateral border on the posterior border of the fibula so that gives you a rough idea and la and the other method is you open anterolaterally and look for the relation of the tibia the talus and the fibula and you must see a equal space between these three that is the mercedes benz sign mal reduction is almost up to 50% and reoperation of this mal reduction does not give you the same result what you can achieve on the first surgery hence evaluation evaluation is most important and always remember the fibula rotates externally by 3 degrees with dorsiflexion and you must make every attempt to restore the relation between the tibia and fibula thank you very much thank you sangeet for wonderfully demonstrating with videos the concept about syndesmosis uh, may i invite professor tanna sir for his lecture on <clears throat> syndesmosis modalities of fixation the screen is seen yeah we can see you and the screen is visible okay now we have seen this dr sangeet has beautifully described the whole thing now we have seen this this is the typical syndesmosis and it is treated by a plating of the fibula and the screw fixation this is the typical syndesmosis treatment now i'll go through a little small repetition maybe the four three major ligaments components provide stability to the syndesmosis and accounting for more than 90% of the total resistance to the posterior fibular displacement and deltoid has a supplementary role main ligament is the joint which is there which is been controlled by First and foremost, the intrusive ligament. Second, 
second is the posterior inferior tibiofibular layer. And the third is the anterior inferior tibiofibular ligament. So these three ligaments are mentioned by Dr. Sangeet. These are the three ligaments which really control the syndesmotic joint stability. Now all these three ligaments break either in substance or in the bone wherever it is attached. All these ligaments have a bone attached to the angle to the end of it. Like this is the telox fracture which Dr. Sangeet showed last time. This is the telox fracture. And with the fracture of the fracture of the fibula, like it happens in the ligamentous injury and the fracture equivalent. The medial ligament is deltoid ligament, medial medullus in the canter. Infrocious membrane is the fibula fracture, 4.5 centimeters above the ankle. Anterior ligament is the telox fracture or a sharp foot fracture, which is known as and posterior tibial fibula ligament is the posterior medullus. So all these four ligaments have a bony attachment. Now, if we fix all these fractures, then all ligaments responsible for syndesmotic instability are made intact. Now, there's no extra syndesmotic through fixation for stability. So, anatomical reduction of the syndesmosis has been found to be the only significant positive predictor for a functional outcome. So, now, when do you need syndesmotic screws? What is the purpose of the syndesmotic screws? This is what is the main thing which you will have to learn. You do the instability test if it is unstable. And that reason we put this in the body screw. But what is the purpose of it? So here is the fracture, fracture of the medial medullus, fracture of the fibula. But anterior and the posterior, there is no fracture. It is fractured it is ruptured at the ligament, which if at all in MRI, you may be able to see that. So this is what it is. So when some ligament insufficiency is with the fractures, but other ligaments break without fractures. If they break with fractures, we fix up the bone, you establish all the stability. But if they break without the fracture, as you can see, like a medial medullus and the fibula, they have the bony fractures. While here, posterior and the anterior ligaments have fractures, ruptured from the substance, which is the X-ray will not reveal it. Even CT scan will not reveal it directly. MRI may reveal it. CT scan will give you in the, in the indirect evidence that the ligaments are fractured. So this is what is now situation. Now stitching the ligaments which are there is not practical. We cannot really stitch the ligament which are separated out and can do that because then it will not be able to push it. So the purpose is you get the tibia and the fibula in anatomical position and fix it up with the screws so that indirectly the ligaments will come into its position and ultimately it will hit it up. So the purpose of the fixation of the syndesmosis is to get the ligaments in the proper normal situation where it has a chance to hit up. So now after fixing the medial medullus and the fibula, we want to know whether the other ligaments are broken or intact. Because we have fixed up the bone which is available on the CT and the X-ray. Still, it's not enough. And that's the reason we have to do all those tests which Dr. Sangeet mentioned intraoperative. That after the fixation of the bones, now we see the stress test. So while if they are torn on a strain, tibia fibula joints will not be stable. That is what we are trying to confirm. So if the ligaments are torn, we do the stress test. Fibula is intact now because of the surgery. Medial medullus is intact for surgery, but anterior and posterior ligaments, any one of them are torn. It is not going to be stable. So when we do the stress test, this is what is going to be done. And those two standard stress tests, which was mentioned is the hook test, which you hook the fibula around. Now, this is the reduce the medial medullus, reduce the lateral medullus, judge if posterior medullus needs repair, Two cotton stays if needed to put to syndrome modus screw by in three cortices. Now, as you can see here, here is the typical test which you are seeing it. That after fixation, you are seeing the opening which is occurring. So this shows indirectly that the ligament is torn. Now, the, the cotton test, this is very subjective. When two people are operating, one a surgeon and assistant, assistant is a nice aditna nahi gumta hai. Why the surgeon may feel it is gunta a little. And there's the reason the cotton test. 
stress internal and external rotation radiographs are more reliable indicator of a mortise instability than the traditional lateral fibular stress as that cotton test is subjective. So now the cotton test has been replaced by external rotation, internal rotation views. So the stress internal and external rotation views is the one which we give you. Now what is this, what is we do it conventionally? Once we decide, once we decide that there is going to be the uh, screw fixation is required in order to stabilize indirectly the ligaments. So this is what is done. We put two screws or one screw or two screws just about above the, above the syndesmotic joint. Now fix the syndesmotic joint. Conventional textbook page instructions are 4.5 millimeter, two screws, two to two centimeters above the ankle, tricortical with the full dorsiflexion of the ankle parallel to the ankle joint. This is what we all believed till now. This is what we believe till now and practice. Now we come out of our comfort zones and we talk about it, what is being done today. So the controversy today is whether you put a 4.5 or a 3.5 screw does not make a difference. Whether you put two screws or one screw does not make a difference because you, now you try to see from the area that we are putting fibula in contact with the tibia in the normal position in order to get the ligaments control in the same situations. So then there is then one screw, two screw doesn't make a difference. 4.5, 3.5 doesn't make a difference. Screw in dorsiflexion or plantar flexion doesn't make a difference. Paul Torneta has beautifully done the studies and he has shown that dorsiflexion is contraindicated while putting the screw. So all of us, what we were doing earlier is not right. So he says you have to do it in a neutral position. Don't do it in a dorsiflexion because that will distort the joint far too much. And then the last one is the leg screw or a non-leg screw doesn't make a difference. Till the time you do not compress the single spotting joint. Now here it is, as you can see, with the clamp, with the clamp which you are doing, it is opening it out unless you close the clamp. Unless you close the clamp. And that's the reason what, what I did it was, I put a leg screw in order to just get the reduction, but not tighten the, not tighten really the, the joint. So I could get with the leg screw a good fixation there. You can you can also do it by holding the clamp and put an ordinary screw. Any of those screws is perfectly all right. And a syndesmotic screw is put from fibula to the tibia. So fibula is lying posteriorly, so obviously it has to go two to three centimeters proximal to the tibial platform, directed parallel to the joint surface and angle 30 degrees because the fibula is placed posteriorly. Now, my observation at times is, if you're putting the plate on the fibula posteriorly, and then you put the type to put the screws, it almost all the time it goes anterior cortex, which doesn't make a difference because you are all what you're doing is, you are stabilizing the fibula to the tibia. So if you are putting the screw from the plate, from the posterior plate, you will not be able to do it. So and, uh, and when you put a lateral plate, when you put a lateral plate, in from, sorry, from the posterior plate, you will be able to put it properly. But when you put it from the lateral plate, you at times, if you unless you go from the plate itself, you will try to go outside the plate, you may not be able to put it in the center. So that doesn't really actually matter. And now what is tricortical fixation is used to usually loosens rather than break, and it may not disturb the normal angle. This is what we did now. When you put tricortical screw, as you can see, it may move, but it doesn't break. So the the controversy is tricortical or four cortical. Four cortical is it has a tendency to break, but otherwise it will function the same way. If at all you put a four cortical, it should be slightly outside the tibia, so that if it breaks, you can take it out from the other side, from the medial side. If it is here only is ending, then you will not be able to take out the broken part. That's the only variation you may have to do if you do photovoltaic. Now the screw from the plate or from outside the plate, again, it doesn't make the difference. Till the time it is going to immobilize the tibia and the fibula into the normal anatomic position. It has also been shown that absorbing the screw 
is also can be used so that there is no question of taking it out because today we have been taught earlier that you put the screw it take out the screw after six weeks and start weight bearing with the screw don't allow weight bearing because it will break the screw and that's the reason some of the people did this at the top people screw now here you can see 35 to 50 percent post-operatively CT shows a mass reduction in stainless body type. You can see it very well. Even if you put the screws, it is not reduced properly. Or you can see it over here. That's the reason why now there is such a big amount of mass reduction occurring. That's the reason the people have started. The whole thing has been rethinking about how exactly we are fixing the thing. So how do we improve that 35 to 50 percent? Unreduced in this body joint, which remains painful. Now, the way is all what we do today is if there is an instability, we put the screw from fibula to tibia. We know it very well that if we know the theory part of it, that tibia to fibula, unless it is reduced properly, you will not be able to get a proper alignment. And that's the reason why you get malalignment. So, if there is an instability, how do you execute to fix the syndesmosis? Mostly, the posterior leg, posteriorly it is displaced. If at all there is an anteriorly it is displaced because of the caput fracture, then it is anteriorly. That you will see it in the CT scan. Mostly it is the posterior malleolus which is fractured. So get the posterior malleolus, uh, posteriorly displaced fibula, get it anteriorly by pushing the fibula anteriorly. Once you reduce the fracture, what you feel it is, hold the reduction and fix up the K-wire. Hold the reduction and fix up the K-wire temporarily. And then put the screw. Because still you are not sure when you're putting the K-wire whether you reduced it properly or not. So once you reduced it properly, the ligaments will come back in its own normal position. It's a system. symbolic. We never go through the joint. It is always three to four centimeters proximal to the joint. Now, the reduction is most important, which is anterior shift of the posterior. Yeah, now, that can also be done with the clamp. You put this, this spike of the clamp in the fibula slightly posteriorly, and this you put it slightly anteriorly, and you clamp it together, you will be able to reduce it. And after reduction, put in a temporary K wire. This is a temporary K wire. Now, in the operation, don't put the screw. After the temporary K wire, exactly as Dr. Sangeet mentioned, intraoperatively we check it up. Then temporarily transfix the fibula to the tibia in reduced position before putting the screw. Because whether the syndosmotic joint is fixed in anatomical position, how do you confirm? Well, if you fix it like this, non-anatomical. You can see the joints are separated out. The ligaments are separated out. So the joints will never become normal. This is going to be the worst situation. And ultimately, this may be painful. And that's the reason, ultimately, you will have to really reduce it and fuse this joint. And still, you are never going to be normal. So how do you now is the main checklist. If you've done this regular, after fixing the sickness body joint, see whether the joint is anatomical position. I will not repeat very much because I think Sangeet has beautifully mentioned that. So, in our intraoperative CT is ideal. In some of those advanced countries, they always have an intraoperative CT. Now, here in the here also now slowly it will come in because some of those rich hospitals they will also buy the CT intraoperative CT. But that is the ideal thing. But in absence of this intraoperative CT, what we have to do is. It, which is difficult in most setup today in India. So interoperative lateral view as very rightly mentioned by Sangeet and position of the fibula to the talus compared with the opposite side. Or open it up anteriorly and see whether everything is perfectly within the, within about the, about the, about the bench side which is there. Now you can see the fibula here, it is reduced and you can see everything is there perfectly all right, but here it is not perfect. This is opposite side and this is the this is the operated side. You can see the fibula is not perfectly all right. You can also see the fibula is not reduced properly. You can see the ankle is, is not in the name, same alignment. So you can, this gives you indirect evidence that it is not single force is not reduced. And once you open up anteriorly, you will be able to know very well. This is tibia. 
this is the fibula, and this is the talus. This has to be into the line, perfectly normal alignment. Now this you can reduce it. You can reduce it if you're doing a lateral plating of the fibula. If you're doing a lateral plating, go anterior to the fibula, and you will be able to judge when you're doing anterior to the fibula, whether the fibula and the tibia is reduced in position or not. Mostly you will be able to judge that. Otherwise, here is the situations which will happen and you will have to really go down, put up the screw fixation and intraoperatively you can correct and can get the best position available. So be aware of the mal reduction. All these are the ones which is mal reduction. This is the caput factor which has gone up. As you can see very well, this is the posterior malleolus which has gone down and this is the one which can give you mal reduction. So when do we remove this index mortis screw? Conventionally, what we have been told is six weeks not bearing and remove the screw and start with that thing. This is the conventional teaching. But why do we put the screw? We put the screw for the ligaments to heal up. The ligaments never heal up in 12 to 8 until yeah, 12 to 16 weeks. So six weeks, if you remove the screw, the ligament details in just in just what is true, they always going to get away completely. And that's the reason why index will be stabilizing the joint that expects ligaments to hit for a permanent stability. So removing the screw at six to eight weeks is not logical as ligaments take a longer time to heal. Must leave the screw for 12 weeks. If it is left, it breaks. So rethinking about that. And that's the reason now so what? Alternate fixation came into the picture. The syndesmosis tightrope has become the implant of choice for repairing the, the syndesmosis. It allows for micromotion of the joint and provides a more accurate method of syndesmosis reduction compared to screws. The syndesmosis tightrope also eliminates second surgeries for hardware removal and may allow for earlier weight bearing. The new knotless syndesmosis tightrope has been improved to eliminate any knot irritation and knot slippage. When performing the procedure, a blunt hemostat can be inserted for countertension. The tightrope strands are pulled straight back to allow the fibula to naturally find the fibula in sisura. The sutures are cut even with the button, making the syndesmosis tightrope sit flush within the arthrex ankle fracture plate. Now, this became a big, big thing in the Western world, and in India also, some of us who didn't have a problem of money for the patient, it's a change over to this. It is costly. It cost in India 22,000 for this um, case itself, the implant itself. This is a flexible fixation. It's not as strong. Now the new things have started coming up after people use this. The tightrope, about the literature of the tightrope, is not as strong. So some of the surgeons say they have to use the second tightrope in order to tighten it. And then there is the more displaced all the at, at all the loads. So two tight ropes came into the picture. And there is more rotational displacement. And these are the few other things of a significant rate of osteomyelitis is disturbing, warranting further investigation. It is, it is about the foot and ankle things. 12 person had irritation needing removal. So many reports of loosening and irritation needing removal. So back to three to four cortices screws. So now we are come back so we come back to our old-fashioned screw, which is today most acceptable. Either two screws or three cortices or two screws, four cortices, but bring screws slightly out of the four cortices to remove it if needed. So in conclusion, if we fix the fractures, all four fractures, if they are there, plate the fibula, interstitial membrane is restored. If we fix the medial malleolus, deltoid is restored. If we fix the posterior malleolus, the posterior inferior tibia fibula ligament is restored. If it picks the show part or a talix fracture, anterior tibia fibula ligament is restored. So all ligaments restored, one does not need syndes mortis screw. So the changeover which has occurred is, if there is a posterior malleolus, even if it is undisplaced, it is not, you are not fixing it up for the bone there, but you are fixing up for the posterior inferior tibia fibula ligament. So today, the surgery has changed. Fix up the medial malleolus, fix up the posterior, fix up the lateral malleolus, and also fix up the posterior malleolus if it is there. Once you fix up the posterior malleolus, the incidence of a syndes mortis screw will decrease dramatically. So there is no, no question of conserving the posterior malleolus because it is a small fracture. It is less than 25% and everything. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much, sir, for bringing out the changing concepts in syndesmosis fixation. Uh, may I invite uh, Dr. Abhishek Kini for his thesis? Most welcome, Abhishek. Thank you very much, sir. I hope I am audible. Yeah, yeah, we can hear you very well. Okay. Uh, okay. So maybe what I'll do is I'll start with I have two cases. One is a pure ligamentous. Uh, syndesmosis and then one is one case that I had shown already in the last master shares but I think I've got a latest follow up of that which is a chronic neglected syndesmosis. So taking what uh, Tana sir and Gawale sir had just mentioned, we'll just mention how we go about in certain ligamentous injuries which yeah. are actually isolated ligaments. So this is a 17 year old male, engineering aspirant was about to give his uh, IIT JEE at a twisting injury during football and this is what his x-ray looked like. So uh, should I go ahead or we'll just... Yeah, yeah, please go ahead with the complete case. So the plan was, he was told you can just cast it in uh, inversion and deltoid will heal and the surgeon felt that the syndesmosis is not that bad. But what about only deltoid? As we know that it is a ring concept in the ankle where if something is broken on the inside, there has to be some disturbance on the outside also. So whether any other imaging is needed. So we got an MRI, which confirmed that there is also a high ligament, high ankle ligamentous injury. And now this injury is what becomes an unstable injury. Because as we know, if there is a single break in the ring, it is stable. But if it, there is a double break of the ring, it becomes unstable and unstable leads to kind of need stabilization. So our plan was, you know, uh, having an access to an arthroscope, arthroscopic evaluation because we need to quantify the joint cartilage, debride the syndesmosis space, stabilize the syndesmosis and repair the deltoid. So this is, was the arthroscopic picture looked like. And this presence of synovium is a telltale sign that there is some instability higher up in the syndesmosis and you should never neglect it along with the, any cartilage injury. So, you know, as uh, Tanasar said, you know, we kind of pass KYS, but, you know, sometimes while passing the KYS, it might open up. So how do you make sure that it is stable? Sir mentioned a big clamp, but what I use is a collinear clamp. It helps me kind of stabilize it in a much better way, in a much more controlled environment where, and plus I'm not dependent on my assistant to kind of hold it up, him moving or my sisters moving or something. So we passed it, we held it with a collinear clamp. We could see that the medial clear space is also closing with this. And at this point is where we passed our screws finally ending up with a deltoid repair because arthroscopically you could also make sure that the deep deltoid portion had come off like a sleeve from the medial malleolus. So this is what happened and ligamentous injuries of the syndesmosis or the deltoid without any bony injuries, which could have been easily neglected, needed stabilization in this manner. So this was the first case where uh, I would like to bring home the point that ligamentous injuries need to be evaluated and managed appropriately. I'll just quickly go on to my uh, next uh, case, which might, uh, you know, encourage a lot of discussion is where, you know, what happens if we kind of neglect the syndesmosis is a persistent painful ankle post fracture fixation. So I'll go in a reverse manner and bring forward the case. Uh, two and a half years back in a 22 year old male, there was a twisting injury diagnosed with an ankle fracture. This was the picture. Attempted close reduction by the surgeon. It didn't work at that time and was treated by an open reduction internal fixation and subsequently mobilized. This was his picture. And this is where they have attempted the tightrope, which Dr. Tanasar said, you know, sometimes the tightrope becomes more like a loose rope rather than the tightrope in the patient. So treated surgically, mobilized subsequently, but still complains of pain and limp while walking. So if you see him, this is his left ankle, which is going in hind foot, is going in valgus. And he has a scar laterally. He is tender anterolateral, restricted dorsiflexion, plantar flexion, special taste. On special testing, he has pain. And if you look at the x-rays critically, you look at his other ankle, which there is an overlap. This side, there is no overlap. MRI confirms that the syndesmosis has not been adequately uh, reduced or the fibula has not been reduced in the incisora as the masters have already shared. And there is some signs of early osteoarthrosis on the lateral ankle. 
So diagnosis was left ankle early osteoarthrosis post ORIF with syndesmotic instability. And now what the plan would be? So either conserve and wait for full blown OA, but he is only 24 now. But I thought that is not the right option. So we intervene. We either fuse or osteotomize and stabilize the ankle. So on arthroscopic evaluation, again same joint debridement evaluation, stabilize. And whether we refix the or reconstruct or we go in for a synostosis. So on arthroscopic evaluation, we could find that again, a lot of syndesmosis, synovium, scarring. We could open up the joint with a, like a 3.5 shaver. The, the shaver itself going higher up in the syndesmosis anterolaterally could tell that there is significant instability between the fibula and the tibia at the lower end. There was also a loose body, uh, which, you know, we could was not allowing us to stabilize. Just to fast forward the video, since I have only seven and a half minutes, you debride the synovium and you go in and make sure that anterolaterally you open the syndesmosis and see that the loose body of small osteochondral was popping up over there. And this was not allowing the syndesmosis to sit in place. So maybe a small loose body, chondral loose body had become this big in two years and had to be removed before we kind of could stabilize. So, so this had to be removed. The fact itself that my big rasp could go into the joint also tells us that there has been ligamentous instability of the ankle. So after removal, you could find that you could sit the fibula back into the ankle. So what do we do? We, for chronic neglected patients, this is a direct repair of, late direct repair of AITFL, which has been described by Bumer. Uh, and we take a small piece of distal tibia along with the fin syndesmosis, like a 10 by 10 footprint and advance it and fix it back slightly anterior and superiorly along with syndesmotic stabilization proximally. This is what was done. And fortunately, after two years, he came to us with the right knee having a locked lateral meniscus. But if you look at him on the left side, his ankle was looking much better. And this is what his current x-rays were looking like. So persistent pain post ORIF, look at the syndesmosis. You can debride loose body removal, get the fibula length back. And important point of stabilizing the syndesmosis is important. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you, Abhishek. Uh, for nicely bringing out the role of orthoscopy in syndesmotic injury. May I invite Dr. Um, Pradeep Munod to please share his screen and present his case. I'll request the yeah. faculty to make comments about both the cases before we get off the question yeah. and answers. Uh, can you see me? And yes, yes, you can see. Yeah, yeah. Excellent. I think uh, Abhishek has done um, quite a job, uh, made my job much easier. So I'll quickly go to two cases. One is a 48-year-old male, pain in the ankle since one year. Had a twisting injury almost a year and a half to two years back. Did not take any treatment and came with pain. There was tenderness over the syndesmosis. There was mild tenderness on the medial malleolus, but not too much. And the alignment was normal. So since the previous speakers were Dr. Tanar, Gavale, sir, Abhishek has already gone through it. I'm sure every all the audiences but understand that there is definitely something happening in the medial and the syndesmosis, probably a previous telltale sign of some medial uh, injury as well. So now what we won't discuss so much, but you've got a CT scan done. You can see here, there was like an osteophytes present on the axial cuts of the CT. Again, osteophytes here that suggests of instability of the syndesmosis. And look here, there was a previous probably a uh, fibula fracture as well. Got an MRI scan as well because I thought there was some arthrosis or arthritis in the ankle joint to see what is the grade and can we preserve the ankle joint as well. Again, syndesmosis was what we saw on the CT scan. So the plan was did an arthroscopy to assess the ankle again and you can see how the squeeze test, you can see a lot of fibrosis, scarring tissue in the anterolateral gutter and the syndesmosis and that's how you do a squeeze test. I think that's very important arthroscopic evaluation of the syndesmosis, I think it is now the gold standard, even compared to the cortex and external rotation. So that was cleared up, the lateral gutter was cleared up, the joint looked reasonably good, so we didn't have to do much on the ankle joint. So that's the intra picture. And then finally, the plan was to do a fusion. Now, this is 
almost a two year old syndesmotic injury and abhishek has already mentioned there are two options either you can do a ligamentoplasty where you have to take either an allograft or autograft of the tendons or you can do a fusion so cleared up the whole syndesmosis made the edges roughened and put a um, uh, recon plate and two syndesmotic screws and this is a year and a half follow up is much better almost completely pain free there is a little bit of early arthritic pain in the ankle but not to bothered about it and he is doing very well so just a quick review on the literature this is stefan remal's article of 2020 where he suggested that chronic syndesmotic instability can be treated with my ligamentoplasty but if you have poor bone stock or failed ligaments or no options of allograft or autograft then a fusion is also a good option another narrative article of again 2021 18 studies have been looked between uh, reconstruction versus syndesmotic fusion and both have done equally well so that's my first case case 2 is very interesting and i think that will open up the whole panel for discussion and um, this is a 53 year old lady twisting injury to the ankle so this was in the november of 2019 and this was the surgeon who fixed it out two days later this was the x ray this was um in march 2020 with just at the start of the lockdown this x-ray was sent to me from rajasthan by the patient and patient's sister is the anesthetist of one of the hospitals and he said uh, she said pradeep what do you think needs to be done so i said i think this needs to be revised we need to do the whole thing again get the fibula length out reduce the syndesmosis clear out the medial gutter plus minus you need to uh, repair the deltoid now unfortunately that time what happened was because of the lockdown you now she was almost ready for surgery going to admit in a week time and her mother was not well and she had to postpone the surgery and then because of the whole lockdown that all got delayed so almost delayed by a, almost 7 8 months and i she was then came ready for surgery and i said why don't you send me a follow up x ray weight bearing x ray this is the weight bearing x ray which was sent in january 2021 look at that now now she said doc i am ready for surgery but i looked at the x ray said i don't think so she needs a surgery look at the x ray left x ray right x ray ankle how has the ankle stabilized how is the syndesmosis reduced how is the medial gutter been uh, cleared up and the deltoid is been repaired or nature is repaired it i don't know this is another follow i said okay that may be something different asked her to get an x ray again in march 2021 she is completely pain free she is walking well there is no deformity so open for question that's i want to know from the experts gawale sir tanna sir and the rest of the panelists what do you think about these thank you very much uh, about the first case where you have yeah. fused the ankle fused the syndesmosis yeah, process. yeah. Uh, usually uh, when you have fixed the syndesmosis tight that means you have not left a millimeter space which is normal after the fixation they mm. always remain painful you are asking me you are telling me sir no no i am i am telling you yeah those sind- have you heard the first part what i yes 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 i heard it sir so they always a tight syndesmosis remains painful so how does a few syndesmosis uh, does not have pain so we are not squeezing that much enough that you are getting the fibula and the uh, tibia almost together and squeezing it because if you squeeze it then the fibula distal end of the fibula which is slightly elastic and the lateral malleolus comes out so you need to put a bone graft there to make sure you are not over squeezing the syndesmosis and you get fusion uh, are you sure that patient is asymptomatic at present yes because see normally what happens is uh, the fibula translate when you walking the fibula is translating in that direction so that will be lost when you fuse it or when you fix it fix the syndesmosis and breaking is a natural event when you put a screw and that sure. is the reason the tight rope came in the picture yes sir but this is slightly different these are chronic instability cases and i mean this is what i have done in four cases now of syndesmotic fusion where patients of arthritis or very very chronic ligamentous issues have um, either you have an option of only syndesmotic fusion and if you uh, stefan remel's article as well as other articles they talk about even in chronic syndesmotic instability 
you go ahead and fuse the syndesmosis and fuse the ankle. Well, Thank you very because, much. Because when you fuse the syndesmosis, what you, the objection was that probably you say it is normal. After fusion of the syndesmosis, it doesn't become normal. It becomes much better than what it was before. And that's the reason why, as you said, if along with that, if there is an ankle arthritis, maybe the active patient may be better off with the fusion of the ankle also. Yeah. So, as, as Tanna sir rightly said, I think the key is to understand where the pain is coming from. And this patient definitely means in my patient, that's where the arthroscopy was done. To sh make sure that only the syndesmosis was unstable and uh, synovitic and the ankle joint was reasonably good to preserve it. So, Arjit, we have few uh, questions on the YouTube. Can you take two more questions? So I have some questions, Chandak sir, for yeah. Gawale sir, Gawale sir and Tanna sir. Please, May I please. ask? Yeah, please go ahead. So, I think there was an excellent talk, but I, I really feel with the whole uh, concept of this uh, seminar was changing the concepts. I would like to ask a few questions which are probably going to change the scenario in the future. So, both Tanna sir and Gawale sir. See, we talk about now because of the usage of MRI and ankle sprains. We are picking up more and more high ankle sprains. What, is, uh, what are your indications for surgery for high ankle sprains? Like only an AITFL if there is a sprain or AITFL, PITFL tear or what, do you, what else do you see in those MRI or CT scan to suggest surgery or non-operative treatment? Sangeet, you would like to answer? Let's sir answer. <clears throat> I think it is, if it is only an ankle sprain, which is, we are talking about, is not a syndesmotic injury. It's a high ankle sprain. I'm talking of only high ankle yeah. sprain, sir. Then obviously it needs a fixation. It is. It cannot be conserved. So it, the, the issue is how, whether you got to diagnose it a high ankle sprain. And if there is a definite high ankle sprain, then there is going to be instability in syndesmosis. And that has to be operated upon. I don't think there is any conservation. So, all high ankle sprains with an MRI which shows AITFL sprain or tear. And the stress you test. And, and the stress test. So, you would probably take them to theatre, do a stress test and see if there is any opening up. Then you right. would suggest it. That's right. Okay, sir. Okay. Um, one more question. No, no, whether you, sorry, whether you agree or you don't agree. Sir, I, I, the, I have had a couple of patients whom I suggested for that and then they never turned up. So the issue is whether he, what activity he is at, whether he is a sportsman, he is young, probably the treatment will not be same for the same age group. It would differ. And second is, uh, um, how do you diagnose that? Uh, like if it is a pure ATLF, uh, uh, anterior yeah. fibular ligament tear in an elderly. So that is not an indication to the for a surgery. Sure. So, unless there is so, a significant instability seen radiologically uh, with all those parameters which have been discussed. So, that so is not again, a, all should not be taken up for surgery. Sangeet, I yes, think sir. what you mentioned about is elderly. Are you talking about that ankle sprain? It is not operated, it is, need not operation after the age of 60. Otherwise, they, they, I, 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 I am very, said, very, very doubtful about it. I said the actual level of the patient. Is, if it is unstable, <laughs> You need, I, you need stabilization because a 60-year-old today also is very active physically. I have hurt you. I know, sir. I'm totally. so, no, no. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, we need the activity we, level of the patient. Yeah. We, we have uh, time for one question. I'll yes. just, uh, just quickly narrate that question. So there and is then a we... question by Dr. Kutub on YouTube. Uh, what is the post-op plan for immobilization and weight-bearing after trimalleolar fixation with syndesmotic injury? Sangeet, go ahead, please. So it is the same like you keep them not, since they are all are intraarticular, uh, at least six weeks, keep them not weight bearing. Or if you give an air cast, probably you can start with a partial weight bearing at about four to six weeks' time. Okay. Thank you so much, Sangeet. And we have uh, time for one more question and then we hand over to Digita, ma'am, for the. Uh, so Dr. Dilip Shah is asking if. Uh, what is the best position to insert the screws of syndesmotic screw? Which type of screw to use and how many cortices and time so of already, removal? Already Tanna sir has covered that. Yeah. So one that question is. may I ask just as a changing game? It, 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 yes. I, I, I would like to say good morning to Dilip Shah. 
So the new Thank philosophy. You so much. <laughs> Sir Chandak sir, just yeah, please. No, no, no. Let me clarify. clarify. Can I clarify, Kanna sir? Hold you hold said hold whether hold. you put it, you put it in dorsiflexion or plantar flexion. But then we have to decide one position in which you want to put. No. I also so said you put it in. A, today, whatever is suggested is you put in a neutral position. And and syndesmosis is such a concept where a lot of controversies and. Uh, new knowledge keeps on. So coming. it is not good morning. Sorry. And secondly, the question was twisted. Please, please it was what question has been asked. Delay. Yeah. The delay, I am not trying to insult yeah. you. Yeah. I am just yeah. uh, in, inducing some sort of a yeah. lighter. No, but there should be a consensus in which position. So you put it in neutral and plantigrade position. That's it. Okay. So Thank final you. answer to this question by Pradeep. Pradeep, can you answer this question? Yeah. Yeah. So where the position should be neutral position, no excessive dorsiflexion, no plantar flexion, neutral and fix it. And I think and the key thing for everyone who's listening is the reduction, reduction, reduction of syndesmosis is more important. Fixation, fixation, fixation. I think that's where the point is. Thank you very much, uh, all the faculty members. We had a wonderful session, and Tanna sir gave a good mantra of reduce, hold, uh, test, confirm, and fix the syndesmosis. Thank you very much, sir, for that wonderful exposition and all the faculty members. And uh, Rujita, uh, I think we hand over for the viewers' announcement. Yes, sir. Thank you so much, uh, all the speakers of the syndesmosis session. I think what is very, very vital is the, what you all have brought out is that alignment as well as stability and function. All three are interlinked, and that is what really uh, paying attention to the concept of syndesmosis changed in the trauma care of ankle fractures. And that's lovely. Uh, Swapnil, uh, we can start the BOS announcements now. And meanwhile, the faculty can continue to log into the YouTube channel and keep the discussion rolling there. Thank you very much, Rishudha, ma'am. Uh, on behalf of the Bombay Orthopedic Society, I welcome all the viewers of this webinar. And I wish all the great teachers who are present here uh, on Teachers Day, doing this master series, a very happy Teachers Day, and those who are watching, and also those who are evolving in being great teachers. The Bombay Orthopedic Society has always been at the pinnacle of excellence as it has teaching, and this month's instructional courses are actually dedicated to two of our great teachers and past presidents of the Bombay Orthopedic Society, who have been the movers, who have been the pillars of strength in their particular subspeciality. So, I think. Can somebody stop my sharing? I just want to start sharing again. Avnimesh, if you can do that. Would you, Amman, you, you do that? Sir, you want me to unshare the screen? Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. I'm having some issues with my laptop. Yeah, Harjot will have to do it, but you can continue verbally saying which are the courses. Sapnil, go ahead. No problem. Yeah, so uh, the first course is dedicated to Professor Dr. Bridgebush and Joshi. This is the POS hand surgery course from September 22nd to September 25th, 2021. Uh, this course is meant for all those uh, residents, fellows who are interested in hand surgery and also to others who are, uh, you know, want to brush up their knowledge on hand surgery. All the courses of the BOS uh, will have MMC accreditation points. And since accreditation is coming up uh, in the next year, I would request all of those who require accreditation to kindly join these courses. And also those who don't, because these are courses which are essentially going to be the core of your clinical practice. The second course is the BOS arthroplasty course dedicated to Professor Dr. Kiti Dolakya, the great doyen of Bombay Orthopedic Society and of India. And this course is from the 29th of September to the 1st of October. Uh, it is a reasonably priced course. So are all the other courses of the Bombay Orthopedic Society. And hence, I request all of y'all, ask your residents, fellows, and people whom you know to kindly join these courses and avail this knowledge. To join these courses, you need to join the Bombay Orthopedic Society website, which is www.bombayorth.in. And if there are any doubts or any questions regarding that, I am here to answer all of them. You can either email me or call me up. My mobile number and email is on the POS website. Thank you very much for all your attention. And over again to Dr. Uchita. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Dr. Mohanty also has a 
announcement. Go ahead, Dr. Mohanty, please go ahead. You able to see my screen? Yeah, we yes. can see you. Yes. yes. हाँ सर बोलो ना Dear friends, uh, I am uh, Dr. Mohanty, the present president of Indian Arthroplasty Association. As you know that uh, we are holding the Silver Jubilee Conference of the Indian Arthroplasty Association next one, that is 22nd to 24th of October in Renaissance uh, Mumbai Convention Center Hotel in Mumbai itself. It was supposed to be there in Coimbatore, but unfortunately they couldn't hold it, so we shifted it to Mumbai. So we have very less time left. The theme is basic techniques and, uh, you know, modern uh, technology transforming lives. We have an exciting, you know, program. Dr. Harish Bhende is the organizing chairman, Dr. Atsis Sai is the organizing secretary, and Dr. Satish Mutha is the co-organizing secretary. We have Dr. N.S. Lard as our patron, he's our past president, and, uh, and there are conference advisors like Dr. Vijay Bose, Dr. Jurani, Dr. Parag Sancheti, and we have an excellent organizing committee. And we have three days program starting on Friday lunchtime to Sunday lunchtime. We cover the common themes like stem cell therapy, thromboprophylaxis, orthoplasty registry, robotics, tribology, and COVID-19 pandemic and total joint practice. In addition to that, we have separate heap and knee sessions, which will cover you know, five panel, you know, panelist discussions, which consist of one plenary talk on one important a talk like you know plenary talk on 22.225 to large heads philosophy and rational followed by five case discussions uh, focused on different topics you will find details in our brochures similarly five knee sessions are there focused on different aspects of the knee replacement surgery in addition to that we have also shoulder session focusing on the shoulder arthroplasty Besides that, we have debates. You know, all the debates focused on hip like you know 3D printed cups, lip liners hip resurfacing or distal fixing steps on the knee side, kinematic alignment, so. estimating mm -hmm. femoral component rotation, et cetera. We have also pre-papers. The most important thing that this year, the award for the best pre-paper will be given as a fellowship award at some center of repute in India. So all the young surgeons are requested to you know, send their pre-paper abstracts. And uh, you have exciting uh, you know, registration packages, which will go through. Just you know, click on the register now here. If you click it, you go directly go to the online registrations. And because it's a Silver Jubilee special, so we have in addition to that different you know, important things which are there. We have a provision for you know, releasing the postage stamp and first day cover from the Department of Post. We will give a silver filigree gift in for the Silver Jubilee. We have a silver copy. The Jubilee coffee table book, we'll so have much, a member's sir. directory, and uh, we have many other exciting, all the webinars containing the pen drives. Thank you very much, and please register early. Thanks a lot. I thank BOS President, Vice President, and Secretary for giving me the opportunity. Thank after, you very much. After the BOS announcement session, now uh, we move on to the third session. That is a very interesting lateral wall concept, evolution, and the evaluation of lateral wall. May I invite uh, Professor G.S. Kulkarni to present his talk on unstable interpretative factors and implications of lateral walls. Kulkarni, sir, kindly share your screen, sir. Hmm. We can see your screen, sir. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Yeah. Uh, unstable intertrochantic fracture and lateral wall, past, present, and future. 
these are the four very unstable fractures 31c3 extension to subtrochanteric fracture reverse oblique and kyle's fracture we annually treat more than 100 cases of intertrochanteric fracture with this experience we have developed four principles of treating intertrochanteric fracture anatomic reduction especially the anteromedial cortices in slight valgus reconstruct the lateral wall compress all fragments and once you compress all fragments no more post operative collapse add powell screw in a cross fashion now in 1990 the trochanteric stabilizing plate was introduced in this case the the uh, lateral wall was not reconstructed and therefore the greater trochanter was pulled up by abductors and excessive collapse occurred. To prevent this collapse, we have started using pull, uh, Powell screw from the base of the greater trochanter to the lower quadrant of the head in a cross fashion, crossing the two screws. Okay. In 2005, Gottfried concluded lateral wall is a key element in endotrochantric fractures. It causes instability and medialization of the shaft. Due attention is not paid even today. Most important factor is it causes loss of initial reduction, reconstruct the lateral wall, and fix it percutaneously. This is his implant. Lateral wall reconstruction prevents instability, excessive collapse, and medialization. There are innumerable articles available in the net. Reconstruction of the lateral wall can be done by tension band wiring, Powell screw and screws, plate in isolation or in combination. Augmentation rationale is all fragments are fixed and compressed, anatomy is restored, convert unstable fracture into a stable fracture gives better functional results, lateral and medial walls both are reconstructed. Our study, what if not fixed? The pieces are loose and are attached to very powerful muscles. These fragments, loose fragments, move when the hip movements occur and cause inflammation. And the inflammation leads to pain, edema, and sometimes infection. These unstable fragments cause instability. Elderly patient will not walk till the fragments become sticky. This takes about four to six weeks. Nail buttresses the lateral wall, no doubt about it, but it does not fix the fragments. These fragments are loose and move. Fixation of the lateral wall improves stability and early union. Patient walks comfortably. Complications are reduced from 9% to 4% in our series. Patient-related outcome is better, prevents medialization. However, all lateral fra fractures does not require fixation. With the experience, we have classified the lateral wall, which guides us in the treatment and prognosis. One, the greater trochanter. The tip of the greater trochanter, which is small and does not need any fixation. The flying GT, which is due to avulsion of the abductor muscles. Large GT. Minimally or undisplaced lateral wall does not require any fixation. Burst or shattered lateral wall Coronal split, short coronal split, which is restricted to IT area only. Long coronal split, which is 
extends to subtrochanteric fracture banana type full banana and half banana rare sagittal split this also does not require fixation now this is the a tip of the fragment which is small and does not require fixation owl this is owl joint fracture which is due to abductor muscles and the large fragment sometimes it is a comminuted fracture the whole thing is comminuted and gets burst fracture a this is a case large fracture both lateral and medial wall are involved and this was treated with collinear clamp using the collinear clamp and a circlage wire and you can see the circlage wire and the fracture united this is a case of reverse oblique lateral wall four piece fracture very unstable this requires lateral wall reconstruction two screws are enough to fix the lateral wall and the reverse oblique and the powell's lag screw prevents collapse and rotational instability this is very important that powell screw prevents collapse and rotational instability and stabilizes the lateral wall and this can be inserted percutaneously and this fracture united this is a burst fracture you can see the burst fracture here and these are some of the other fragments you can see this fragment is so there only if you put a nail here this will not be stable the nail will be very very unstable this is again a burst fracture needs augmentation with one wire and one uh, screw and this fracture united shattered lateral wall causes instability as important as posteromedial fragment instability buttressing prevents collapse shattered lateral wall uh, it fracture extension into the neck of the femur what is called a kyle's fracture this was you can see there is a burst fracture here in this case and this was treated with reconstruction of the lateral wall and valgus reduction and the fracture united this lady 65 year old lady had fracture dislocation of the hip fracture neck of the femur fracture intertrochanteric fracture and fracture subtrochanter this was treated with uh, first reduction of the hip joint and fixation with the pelvic fixation and was treated with uh, dhs and reconstruction of the lateral wall this nicely united one year later note the valgus reduction again here in this case and four years later and this she had good function she can walk very nicely and went back to her uh, farming business this is a very unstable fracture 31 ac3 shattered fracture lateral and medial wall are shattered subtrochanteric extension is there however in this case we treated with a uh, reconstruction of the extension band but it was not properly done uh, and so reconstruction this needed again a further plate or some other screws etc but so reconstruction was not proper so the a uh, fracture got into non union and the nail broke with such complex fractures we now treat with nail and a plate and augmentation so nail plate is a very powerful construction however this patient after 3 years came back and to our surprise the fracture has united he has no symptoms but in a varus position this is another case of a burst fracture if you see this case uh, if you just put a nail somewhere here and it is going to be very unstable because the head will be only having one screw and will not be stable enough so this needs a lateral wall reconstruction and this we did with a tension band tension band is equally good uh, 
and the two separate tension bands were used here. X-rays at eight months showed united with good function. This is three EC three fracture. Nail alone will not uh, uh, will not will alone fail. So you can see this. You put the nail here somewhere, and uh, very difficult to uh, say that nail will alone is enough for this. So we again treated with uh, tension band wiring and uh, oxygen. Now coronal split. This is a, a short coronal split. You need uh, an anterior posterior uh, screw here like this. You can see here this uh, anterior posterior screw. And the tension band wiring here is screw, extra screw. And you can see this, this is the anterior posterior screw. Sorry. This is a long coronal complex fracture. Nail alone will fail because the nail will, the screw will pass uh, through this fracture. And these are very unstable fracture, large posterior and required. So this needs uh, a plate, nail and augmentation. So nail plate combination is good enough for this case and the fracture united. This is an good function. He has all function. Long coronal split, note this is a comminuted trochanter, subtrochanter fracture, very unstable complex fracture and a long coronal split here. So this also needs a, a nail plate combination. Nail plate combination is much more stabler than any single implant in any fracture fixation. The not only uh, trochanter, but in any fracture fixation, nail plate combination is a powerful construct. Banana type. See, this is the banana type. And this has, uh, you can see that this is uh, uh, supported and balanced by abductors and uh, psoas muscles. So this fragment does not move much. But this is a large fragment and uh, needs further treatment. So this was one percutaneous lag screw is enough to uh, lag screw is enough to fix this fragment. And however, if you nail alone, you will not is unstable. You can see how the fragment is moving here. Uh, this is the banana type, and you can see this is the fragment moves. There. This was treated with uh, uh, nail and uh, anterior posterior screw and augmentation, and the fracture united. This is another case of banana type. This was again treated with a nail plate, nail and accessory. Another case of banana type, I'll quickly go through this. Uh, this is again treated with a, a reconstruction of the lateral wall and this. This is what I call half banana. You can, you can see this is the half banana, which is free to move because this is freed from the abductors and the psoas muscle will uh, will move and doctor. So this needs fixation. So nail plate and augmentation is necessary for this case. This is the another second another case of half banana. You can see the fragment has moved because of the psoas muscle, and this is needed uh, circulage wire. In this case, we have used triangular construct. This is a collinear clamp, a circulage wire passer. This is a very, very useful instrument. Uh, these two instruments are very useful for treating uh, in, uh, complex uh, intertrochanteric fractures. This is the method how you do it. And uh, first we do the uh, reduction and circulage wiring and then pass a nail and then plate and uh, screw and finally Pavel screw. This is the Ganjale plate which we have modified for using this. Now this can be done uh, uh, percutaneously the plate can be inserted. Uh, the first as I told you first we insert the nail then insert the plate percutaneously and then the hip screw and finally, the Powell screw. It takes hardly 10 minutes extra to fixation of these methods. Yeah. 
We have published this in injury August 2017. Future and our conclusion. Complex IT fracture with lateral wall fracture. Nail and plate combination is a very powerful uh, combination, powerful construct. And one may have to add to it augmentation by one screw or tension band. Reconstruct the lateral wall with a plate, tension band, uh, tension band and screws or alone or in combination, depending on the uh, each case. Uh, reduce and compress all fragments. Once you compress, then prevent post-operative collapse. There are the future will be the newer methods to prevent post-operative collapse, which is very very important. That the shortening will not occur. Uh, for example, we have developed the Powell screw, which is extremely useful. Powell screw will prevent the uh, excessive collapse. It stabilizes the lateral wall and it also gives more stability to the construct. However, all this needs further study, biomechanical studies, uh, randomized control studies, and then only it will be acceptable. Otherwise, the world will not accept our concept of uh, lateral wall reconstruction. Thank you very much, uh, Rajendra and uh, BOS team. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, sir, for your <coughs> Um, lecture on concepts in lateral wall. So next we have a lecture from Dr. Vivek Shetty um, on why fix the lateral wall in unstable IT fractures when fixed with PFNA. So uh, another concept. Good morning, friends. At the onset, I'd like to uh, thank Bombay Orthopedic Society and uh, Dr. Rajendra Chandak for the invitation. Uh, the brief that I have been given is how critical is the lateral wall in unstable intertrochantric fracture when fixed with the proximal femoral nail. So the fractures encircled are the ones that we are talking about, the AO, A2.3 and the A3 fractures where the lateral wall is fractured and uh, these are the fracture patterns that we are familiar with that we are going to address. We had, uh, I came across this classical article from in 2009 JBGS from the American Academy by George Heidekovich talking about how to improve your results and they suggested the 10 tips. We are familiar with most of them. The tip apex distance should be less than 25. Whenever there is uh, uh, absence or fracture of the lateral wall, you shouldn't be using a sliding hip screw. In unstable IT fracture, they should all be nailed. Avoid various angulation of the proximal fragment at all cost, and of course, avoid uh, uh, fractured side distraction. So these are basic uh, uh, tips that was suggested. I looked at my old series of cases in 2008, I saw this A3, A3 type of fracture, a reverse type of fracture, which I had fixed with a recon nail. And uh, I intraoperatively, I had uh, got a good medial contact and anterior contact. On a post-op X-ray, I saw that the lateral wall has fractured off. And I was worried about the stability of the fracture. And uh, I closely observed it. The patient had no uh, untoward complaints and in one year's time, the lateral wall consolidated and the fracture united solidly. Similar fracture, 80-year-old lady with the, a very unstable IT fracture. Same principle followed. Anterior contact was well maintained anatomically and uh, a medial contact. In this case, lateralization of the shaft so that there is no further collapse in the neck. And uh, that's the follow-up at three years with solid union with the lateral wall reconstituted. Another very challenging comminuted fracture proximal uh, uh, femur with the PC cervical and the lateral wall, which is flown off very clearly. This was fixed, again, maintaining a good anterior and uh, medial contact. And uh, that's the post-op X-ray 
and that's a follow up at one year and the patient did extremely well so in an unstable intertrochanteric fracture is maintaining or restoring the integrity of the wall creature some surgeons would want to do a intermedullary nail and reconstitute the lateral wall with either a circlage wire with a reinforcing screw or a plate reinforcement as in this case so in order to understand whether the lateral wall is important let us look at the biomechanics of what happens when an intertrochanteric fracture occurs and then extend that to your fixation principle for example if somebody falls there is a tendency of the head to drift into varus the abductor pulls pulls the shaft to the top and there is external rotation by and large and you end up with an x-ray looking like that now what happens in the anterior cortex which is not very well uh, appreciated with the external rotation what happens is there is a tension force on the anterior surface and you see a simple fracture pattern on the anterior cortex and there is compression of the posterior cortex so there is a comminution in the posterior cortex that's the sort of fracture pattern that you see with the comminution and that's the siam picture that you see typically when you have these unstable fracture where the shaft is sagging down with gravity and the neck is kind of shifted anteriorly so coming back to this case how do you address it now there was a very good paper came out in 2007 and this is the principle that i have been following the last 14 years for all my intertrochanteric fractures how to make an unstable fracture stable by reconstituting the anterior cortex as well as the medial uh, anatomical reduction at the calcar level and it's a very good paper i would recommend there is also some uh, data to show that the anterior cortex is a good couple of millimeter thicker than the posterior cortex and the medial cortex we all know that the calcar is thicker by a couple of millimeter in relation to the anterior cortex so it stands to reason that you need to reconstitute the anterior and the medial wall here's a case in example that we just showed so you have the hip in varus and there is an anterior displacement in the ap view what you do is you want to get it in uh, the he, the head and neck shaft angle into var, uh, valgus correct the varus now you could do it with traction you can use a reduction tool what about in the lateral view you would use a, some sort of a reduction tool so that you can get the anterior cortex lined up nicely so once you have got the uh, valgus angle once you have got the ap corrected then you can you are ready to get your nail in and you can get your helical blade or your uh, screw in place depending on your choice and you get your tip apex distance in the lateral view as i said you kind of get a good anterior cortex continuity and then proceed with your fixation and that's the post op x ray good valgus position and i showed you anterior cortex continuity and a year down the line solid union with no shortening as opposed to the siding screw on the other side so the concept is the intramedullary nail is a buttress it substitutes for the comminution of the posterior medial as well as the lateral wall and provides solid stability and hence not requiring any reconstitution of the lateral wall so is maintaining the integrity of the lateral wall critical not really but there are some caveats to that so i would like to kind of uh, get uh, show you a few cases as to how i do my proximal femoral nail so i do this scissor position where the good leg is not under traction all that it does is prevents the pelvis from drifting to the other side when the traction is given that's the position in a nutshell the reduction is uh, achieved in a standard fashion with traction however if there is an anterior displacement or a varus position i use reduction tools anteriorly as well as uh, on the superior cortex to get the valgus and the anterior cortex in some case if there is a medial comminution with a large beak i put a circlage wire as shown now this is the anterior cortex reduction good bone to bone contact anteriorly a center center screw the apex distance is good and in case if you have a instability in some fractures in spite of the reduction tool then i hold the reduction tool and put stabilizing uh, kushno wires anteriorly and then start my uh, entry of the guide wire and the reaming so remember get the reduction properly hold the reduction if it is unstable and then proceed with your fixation try and get a center center 
so helical blade position with a tip apex distance less than 25 and that's the position that you want to see every time with all case as i make an attempt to do this is a good reduction tool you can use any the reduction tool can be manipulated if there is too much valgus you can correct that in the anterior cortex as i have shown you can also pull if there is uh, too much valgus from the top or from below the incision lower incision to get the reduction and of course you can also use some reduction tool like the collinear clamp that i have shown and then stabilize it temporarily with the anterior k wire and then start your uh, nailing so just some case examples of instable unstable it fracture the same principle has been followed for the last uh, 14 years and i'll share you a few cases unstable it fractures i uh, not do not pay any, any attention to the lateral side however medially i get an anatomical or a lateralization of the shaft and on the lateral view i get a good anterior cortex so that's the union here's another case where there's a lot of comminution good valgus position and the lateral wall has not been fixed this is one of my earlier 10 years old x-rays i now would have added a circlage wire and that's at five years good solid union another case example a type of a, a reverse uh, it fracture again you can see my hook trying to get the valgus position reduce reduction in the uh, lateral view good bone to bone contact that's the position post op see there's a comminution posteriorly and the lateral wall however there is a good lateralization of the shaft and good anterior continuity as seen and the fracture goes on to heal uneventfully another case in example i can show you series of cases similar principle adopted lateral wall not addressed medial and anterior addressed and you get a good union at 9 months and again a badly shattered uh, uh, four part or a comminuted fracture again valgus again lateralization of the shaft good anterior continuity and that's the x-ray and that's the one you follow up to show good union so the same principle has been followed again and again and the lateral wall has not been addressed and you've got a good union at some some uh, where, where there is a extra comminution but as long as there is a good medial bone to bone contact and i do not address the comminution as long as there is a lateralization as well as an anterior con continuity as this four year follow up shows there is a good reconstitution of the lateral wall case number 11 again the same principle and that has gone to heal uh, uneventfully what about the uh, there's a lateral wall comminution with extension into the shaft reconstitution of the medial wall by circlage wire nothing is done to the lateral side and that's a one year follow up for union so in the last uh, uh, 12 years i've had a series of 261 cases of which 92 were unstable with fracture of the lateral wall and uh, i've had 234 cases available for the study and this i've been have sent it for publication i have not had to revise uh, almost 95% of these cases. I'll show you some of uh, my complications. This is uh, a 72 year old lady. Remember the principle was to get varus, good medial continuity and that I failed. This is one of my 10 year old ago case and I had not followed the basic principle and by nine months the nail broke. It was not the problem of the implant as much as trying to get the valgus get good medial continuity in this case by using a bridging graft circlage wire to include it and at the end of one year she had an uneventful union so rely on the implant provided you have good medial continuity as well as anterior continuity another case example again one of my cases uh, there is a busy cervical fracture in addition to the lateral wall fracture again the reconstitution was well done it is not uh, a failure of the implant here. It is a busy cervical fracture. This is a one-year follow-up. The fracture has solidly healed, but because of the busy cervical, the vascularity of the head was a problem. Again, not a problem with the implant, intermedullary implant, as much as the vascularity of the head, which has needed to be revised to a THR, a simpler uh, revision, rather than trying to do a primary THR in a four-part or an unstable fracture. Another case where I uh, had a comminution, again, a lateral wall fracture, 
I reconstitute the medial side, lateralize the shaft, and that's the follow up. At three months, one year the fracture is healed, but at three years, because of the busy cervical fracture, there was an AVN and a secondary OA. She has not come for a revision. She is still kind of soldiering on. So these are the three cases of mine which I had to do something additionally. The last one I haven't yet done. Another case uh, done elsewhere. Uh, the tip apex distance uh, is uh, more than is about 27 millimeters, and the helical blade came out. Not my case. Again, the, there was nothing like a lateral wall when I revised this uh, patient. And that's the fixation. I still revised, uh, re de depended on the implant, intermedullary implant. As you can see in the picture, there is nothing like a lateral wall. By the end of one year, that reconstituted and she had an uneventful union, though I tried and got every mi millimeter that I could get in the head and got a union in this case. So in the complication, I would say one complication of mine where there was varus and I had to bone graft. Second was because of the avascular necrosis. I'd like to believe it is because of the basic cervical nature of the fracture where I had to do a dual mobility THR. There's another one which had an AVN, but the fracture had united. So the implant has succeeded. It was a vascularity in question. And the last one was a fixation done elsewhere because of poor TED. So out of a 200 and uh, 60 odd cases, three are the ones that I see a potential problem in. This idea was uh, uh, accepted and my uh, fellow Dr. Sajeev Shekhar uh, presented in the last Viroc and was selected in the Masalawala paper and it was well received. It was also submitted in the recently concluded uh, CCOT AO trauma webinar and uh, uh, was selected as the best paper of July 2021 and is going to be is also been accepted as the most outstanding paper for the whole year we see whether he'll get the uh, award for the year 2021 so in conclusion i'd like to kind of bring forth a few points avoid a virus reduction lateralize the shaft or get an anatomical reduction in in the ap view get an anatomical reduction of the anterior cortex in the lateral view this is the key do not try and ream the fracture till you have got a reduction, if need be with additional Kirshner wires. Make sure the tip apex distance still holds, which is the same principle in the uh, in your THS. And at the end, I'd like to conclude with all the cases that the lateral walk does not need fixation when you do proximal femoral nail for unstable IT fractures. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Vivek Shetty. Next, we have lecture from Dr. D.D. Shah. He'll be speaking on DHS in fixation of unstable intertrochanteric fracture, lateral wall, and use of DHS. My dear friends, I'm Dr. Dilip Shah, and I'm going to talk to you about uh, DHS in unstable interdrogenic fractures. So the topic is DHS in fixation of unstable interdrogenic fractures. Lateral wall also will be considered. Whenever you have unstable interdrogenic fractures, it becomes mandatory to have some hold over the comminuted pieces. All you know that A1 types of fracture, these are stable and where we can use a dynamic hip screw. And also A3 types of fracture, which are quite unstable, can be dealt with by proximal femoral nail. So the question arises in A2 types of fracture where we have both the possibilities, either to use a compression hip screw or we can use a PFN. Now, these are stable fractures. Beyond A2.2, they are all unstable fractures. And if you want to appreciate, actually, this is a stable fracture. This is an unstable fracture where the lesser trochanter and or a greater trochanter also may be fractured. If you want to appreciate on a CT scan, this is a greater trochanteric fracture. This is a lesser trochanteric fracture. So the situation is difficult. In olden times, we used to use calcium phosphate cement augmentation. 
quite often we used to use hydroxy apatite coated screws which yielded some good results but today we don't use all of them purely if you are going to use dhs then the primary aim for any fracture is proper reduction fracture reduction is very imperative and when you see on lateral x ray there is double density of medial cortex and there is evidence of intersuscepted neck into the shaft which is seen on the lateral traction will not reduce this sag but a lever into the fracture will reduce it and see how nicely it has been reduced so do not start any surgery unless you have got a wonderful reduction there are some special situations which i have encountered if you see this fracture very clearly the proximal fragment is in varus and it seems to be pretty odd you try various maneuvers of reduction and you will realize that external rotation only will reduce it externally rotated get a good reduction temporarily fix it with guide wires and additional wire and then fix it it becomes a wonderful reduction and wonderful surgery to get the best outcomes guide wire within central two thirds of the head in two views wires within the head and make an angle of 135 degrees if at all you want to err inferior and posterior may be accepted and this is the best place where trabecular pattern is pretty good tip to apex distance has to be maintained so the best results were when occupied a central position in both ap and lateral projections and 10 mm or less from the surface of the head give the best possible results don't do this kind of mistakes tip to apex distance also is very very important now intramedullary fixation versus dhs plate fixation what is the big deal whatever implant you are well versed with there are some situations where you can use them so if it is unstable then you can use additional anti rotation screw with a washer and stabilize it or when you feel that the entry point on the lateral wall is too thin and it will fracture then you can use a pediatric richard because the barrel of this pediatric richard is only 12 mm so it will not shatter the lateral cortex and in addition you can use one anti rotation screw diamond houston they showed this osteotomy medialization but for last 20 years they have not been doing it but there are special situations like severe comminution and likelihood of collapse medialize it because otherwise the cortex at the entry point will fracture and will get medialized automatically and you will end up by putting too long a dhs so for diamond houston what you need to do is insert your implant from the fracture site into the inferior quadrant of the head telescope the beak the calcar into the shaft release the traction and telescopic absolutely inside and then fix the plate which ultimately yields an angle of 160 to 170 degrees which will compensate the shortening which is going to happen because of this valgus so enter from the fracture site into the inferior quadrant make the nef shaft angle of 160 to 170 degrees and then fix it up this an unstable intertrochanteric fracture lesser trochanteric fracture greater trochanteric fracture and then entry was made from the fracture site and a screw of 55 mm listen to me carefully only 50 to 60 mm screw will go inside this then telescope the big inside and then put the plate on the shaft and fix it up traction release is absolutely important this is the result at the end of 3 months now additional fixation with dhs where lesser trochanter also you want to fix it up a circlage will do the needful the lesser trochanteric fracture can be small size or a big size or a big chunk like this <coughs> so you can fix it up with a circlage the big 
postromedial fragment also. Trochanteric stabilization plate is essential whenever you have big comminution. You fix the DHS with one screw. Now the TSP is mounted over the DHS plate and is fixed using the holding cortical screws which will connect the plate to the shaft. Depending on the fracture pattern, if the greater trochanter is not captured by TSP, a tension band wiring may be added to hold the abductor muscle insertion reduced and securely fixed. A screw may also be added through the plate into the neck to prevent rotation of the head and the neck fragment. This is how you will complete your fixation with TSP. An example where TSP has been done and the abductor muscles have been held with the tension band wire. Mm. Some example of DHS with TSP at the end of six months. A very important thing that whenever you have deficient trochanteric area, you need to fix it up. But a situation where severely porotic bone is there, it's a very severely comminuted, unstable fracture. Do not overstretch your indication of DHS, but do a proximal femoral nail. Take home message. Choose the implant with which you are comfortable and experienced. Reduction is the key step in successful outcome. TSP, trochanteric stabilization plate, should make the construct stable. Postromedial fragment can be stabilized by a circlage or some other maneuver. Diamond Houston medialization sometimes is a necessary evil in highly unstable fractures with lateral wall fracture. You will need a screw of only 50 to 60 millimeters and a short barrel. Pediatric Richard, when a lateral wall is very small, additional anti rotation screw to impart more stability. In highly unstable fractures, 3 1 A3 types, PF1 is the ideal choice and do not overstretch your indication of DHS. I thank you very much for uh, giving a wonderful attention to my talk. If there are any questions, I'm willing to answer. Thank you very much. You are muted. You are muted, sir. You are muted. Uh, thank you very much, sir, for your uh, lecture on role of DHS in intertrochanteric unstable fractures. And next we have lecture from Dr. Shiv Shankar on PFN in fixation of intertrochanteric fractures. <clears throat> Hello, everybody. At the outset, let me thank Dr. Rajendra Chandak for this opportunity given to me to share my views on fixation of IT fracture with intramedial oh. when there is a lateral wall deficiency. Friends, there are various ways when the fracture is very badly communicated or the lateral wall is very badly communicated to fix them. Dr. Naveen Thakkar from Gujarat and Dr. Designed trochanteric buttress plate. Dr. Sushil Babulkar and Sunil Kulkarni have their wiring technique published. And I am sharing an unpublished technique of how I fix them. This is Dr. Naveen Tucker from Ahmedabad having a trochanteric buttress plate. Dr. Shashikant Ganjale, again, you can see that the screw heads are touching the plate where the lateral wall is missing and they compensate for the deficit lateral wall. Here, Dr. Babulka's video showing the wiring technique. If the lateral wall is in single piece, I normally fix them with a screw, and that has been published as in the SICA journal. Recently, I published 10 commandments to get our good results with PFN. The eighth point I have reiterated there is the fracture should be very well compressed on table. Here is a 75 year old lady. And you can see that the screw heads are touching the lateral wall even after the union at 14 months, they are still touching the lateral wall, indicating that the fracture was adequately compressed. If the fracture is not adequately compressed, the screw heads will be 
outside the bone in the lateral side and they can rock in and out leading to trouble like breakage of the screw z effect or even the nail has broken in this case where the fixation of the screw was good in a good strong bone uh, this is in my own setup where the traction was re not released at, at the final tightening and you can see that the screw heads have already slided out and also the screw has broken another case where the fracture was not adequately compressed and also there was no subcondral fixation you can see that the screws walked out because of the rocking movements which can happen the screw head requires the support of the bone and if the support of the bone is not there for the head of the screw then they can toggle this toggling will lead to fixation loss in the head of the uh, threads of the screw and that will gradually slide out and this sliding out causes loss of purchase in the osteoporotic bone that is one of the reason why in a transfacial fracture there is more than 30 to 40% of failure rate in due course of time so nowadays we replace one or two partly threaded cancellous screw with a fully threaded screw to avoid this sliding back or we also use a 95 degree screw which is called as the powell screw which can also prevent undue collapse so fracture should be compressed adequately on table and there should not be any undue collapse that's the basic uh, point what i want to reiterate here friends the head of the screw requires a support this support can be either the lateral wall or if the lateral wall is missing in comminuted fracture the nail itself can act as the lateral wall so here are some pictures of comminuted lateral wall fractures where i have used this technique a badly comminuted lateral wall fracture you can see that the screw heads are touching the nail and this is after the implants have been removed in the same patient this is what i call as the technique of tackling the deficit lateral wall uh, with with the nail implant itself elderly patient 85 year old man again on table you can see and the lateral wall has been pierced by the screw and the heads are touching the nail and the patient is comfortably walking in the immediate post operative period and when the patient came for follow up at 10 weeks he was so thankful to me and he was literally crying but he never thought that at this age he will have a good outcome and i have the permission to project his face in front of you for this picture another elderly lady of 85 years Uh, operated sometime in 2013 or 14 you can see that intraoperatively i am piercing the lateral wall or the lateral wall is missing and the screw heads are touching the nail and this is at one and a half months post operative and this is at around four and a half years when she came for follow up in 2019 you can see that the screw heads are still touching the nail and it has given very good results this is a demonstration case done during pony trauma course at sanjeeti hospital where there was missing medial trochanter as well as the lateral wall so to compensate for the uh, medial fractured trochanter i have got additional valgus and to compensate for the lateral wall i have put the screw against the nail and this is just at four weeks post operative just after a month dr atul patel shared me this picture which shows nice results friends the newer nails have the system of compressing either by pushing the screw uh, pulling the screw or pushing the sleeve inside so by tightening this nut you can push the sleeve and you can compress the fracture and uh, this is a more new halifax nail which i was using and you can see i compressed the fracture on table and inserted the set screw to prevent collapse as soon as the jig was removed you can see that the fracture has got distracted the reason is the next screw is not having a head the counter support which requires from the lateral aspect is not there so in, in none of the newer implants have got the facility like this so that is one of the reason why i don't like newer implant i use the regular tfn or the pfn and i adequately compress on table by releasing the foot and traction and compact the fracture by alternately compressing the superior screw and the inferior screw till i am satisfied so this is very very important for getting good results so here 
all these three cases i have already shown where i have used the nail itself as the lateral wall and they have given me adequate uh, results or expected results friends i am very very happy with this atmanirbhar or the indian pfn which is available only in india and unfortunately due to many reasons including the, the commerce as well as the patent issues there are newer nails available in the market unfortunately none of them have got a head so it is very very difficult to compress them there is no counter support at the lateral wall with these implants and that is the reason why newer implants cannot be used for the technique what have been demonstrating here is an example a elderly ma male i had operated grandfather of a orthopedic surgeon and i operated baramati again similarly the lesser trochanter was miss uh, avals so i have got additional valgus screw heads are touching the nail and this is at eight weeks post operative recently when i went to baramati to operate another patient another senior uh, person so this patient came walking and felicitated me and this is the uh, good reconstruction and maintenance of the neck shaft angle patient able to walk unsupported at the age of 86 years he is able to walk unsupported within the house and he uses a stick when he is going out this is the patient i operated on the same day again there is lateral wall missing there were a lot of morbidities in the patient including severe osteoarthritis and varus of the knees and this again you can see that the screw heads are touching this picture i got at the end of 6 weeks post operative where the patient was able to walk friends another patient again a relative of a orthopedic surgeon where i have used the technique of reconstructing the lateral wall using the trochanteric buttress plate as well as the wiring technique as advised by dr sushil uh, babulkar and sunil kulkarni so uh, either we can reconstruct the lateral wall and either with a wire or a plate and give the support to the screw head or the nail itself can work as the lateral wall that is the message i want to convey uh, through this talk uh, this is a case of dhs done elsewhere and the patient came at 15 days already you can see that the implants are uh, backing out or due to uncontrolled sliding here again i have used the technique of uh, reconstructing the lateral wall with pfn and trochanteric buttress plate as well as the wire as the patient was very young but this is at uh, around 65 years old only unfortunately i have not got any follow up of the patient due to the covid restrictions thank you very much thank you shiv shankar sir harjot if you can present your case harjot we invite you to present your case please Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So this is a very interesting session on lateral wall with wide spectrum of uh, varying views. So let us see what Harjit wants to present. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I would like to uh, thank everyone for this opportunity, and I will be fast and quick as we are running late. So this is the case. Uh, which presented to us on after two weeks of surgery and there was varus and the lateral wall was uh, broken after the dhs insertion so after further wait of few, two more weeks there were signs of infection and further displacement of fracture was noted so it was a similar case as per jacobson's paper and uh, as lateral wall was broken and there was further displacement also there was early signs of infection so it was decided to revise the case and uh, it was managed with open reduction again and uh, use of uh, lavage wash and addition of an trochanteric stabilization plate along with antibiotic coating of a nail of plate so this is a antibiotic coating over the dhs plate uh, the so armamentarium that we should keep for lateral wall reconstruction uh, as shared by chandak sir our trochanteric stabilization plates of various kinds hook plates and also other small t plates the so, trochanteric stabilization plate this is a very simple add on procedure for uh, stabilization of 
the lateral wall in case because in this case we didn't have entry site for pfn so after 3 months we were able to salvage the patient and uh, there was sign of early callus the patient came weight bearing and walking comfortably with callus visible these are the modifications of trochanteric plate with cut ends of the slots so that it can be slided even after dhs barrel has been inserted so with addition of the trochanteric stabilization plate there is prevention of medialization of shaft and also there is support of the lateral wall through which we can insert one or two cancellous screw also if we want as shared by dr kulkarni sir a word um, horizontal powell angle screw can be inserted to the uh, trochanteric stabilization plate Uh, while doing dhs lateral view should also be noted for integrity of the lateral wall and if there is doubt of uh, shattering of the lateral wall then uh, we should not hesitate to add a trochanteric stabilization plate so addition of two screws uh, or one screw as per comfort and space can be done uh, we have found it to be a useful addition in uh, cases where there is weak lateral wall but we have proceeded with uh, dhs thank you very much thank you rajot for your case uh, we have time for one question each on the topic um, dr sangeet you wanted to ask some question so there is a question on youtube which i yeah. like both the convenience yeah. to address at the end of it um what is the final recommendation in view of Uh, the lateral wall contrasting opinions when to fix when to ignore and what is the tip for osteoporotic uh, fractures what is the lower limit of acceptable neck shaft angle these three things if you can sum up in your uh, uh, take home and question from sangeet dr shakib bhai you can please answer this question yeah i think sangeet is going to discuss or Actually, if you want, uh, we are a little bit short of time. Sangeet, are you around? So, sir, you can you can sum up the uh, on the yeah, wide spectrum of opinions. Yeah. Now, when we planned this topic sometime in May, I think, or April, Dr. Chandak would remember, and Rujuda had told us to take up some game changer topics, and the lateral wall came up, and I hope Rujuda, you are satisfied because it has changed the game. within half an hour of the discussion there is such a lot of varied opinion on the same issue i'm sure there is open up a lot of thinking for everybody who is a part of this whether they are panelists or they are just on the youtube so much to think about but i think all of us are on agreement on one or two issues dr vijay also for summed it up very nicely that your reduction before whatever you do whether you do a dhs Where you put in a nail is immaterial, but your reduction is of prime importance. Without a proper reduction, whatever implant you are going to use may not be working. Another nice, good, important point made out was that the, when you are doing an intramedullary nailing, the lateral wall—I mean, the nail—is the lateral wall. And I remember uh, we attended a session in Jaipur long ago, and uh, the gentleman was there from. Uh, apna, where was he from? Barbos, Barbot, Barbos. His name was Paulo Barbos, and he made a very nice point that when you are doing a PFN, don't think DHS. Don't think DHS and do a PFN. When you are doing a PFN, do a PFN. When you are doing a DHS, do a DHS. And I think that was a very important thing. Another big point was about doing. Uh, I mean, uh, about osteoporotic fractures. i am a person i mean normally now i am a, personally i like to do a pfn and i do pfn for all cases and i would agree to with uh, what dr vivek said that a lot of times lateral wall augmentation is not required either by the power, power either, either by the power screw or the different plates which have been shown a proper intramedullary implant like a pfn most of the time is sufficient to give you a good fixation and a proper healing Dr. Chandra, anything more to add? Yeah, thank you, Dr. Kapadia. We do agree on one point, and we really uh, have varying opinions on lateral wall. Mm -hmm. And uh, the faculty has really brought out various points. So delegates have a discretion to use 
uh, in a given case, what would work best in their hands. So we quickly move on to the next session. After yes, this, before that, sir, one question yeah. from Dr. Nadir Shah. He has raised yeah. his hand. He is yeah, the MMC please. observer. Yeah, yeah. Nadir Shah, sir, please, please. Uh, so, sir, my question to you only, sir. A very uh, good afternoon. Yeah. Yeah. So the question is a bit with uh, Advent uh, and with, with all this discussion and all. Can can we come to a conclusion that DHS has become a, a, a implant for only uh, stable fractures, number one? And uh, you can say, you can also say that it can be also used or kept it as an implant where you need a bailout uh, situations. So with the advent of intramedial nail and it becoming more modified with every era, DHS is only becoming a, a, a plate for stable fractures or a bailout. Do you think it is it is a right uh, concept? Absolutely, sir. Well brought out point. And we most of us and definitely would agree on this point that DHS is to be considered for all stable fractures. It's an implant of choice possibly. And for all unstable fracture, currently with the current literature available, nailing, intramedullary nailing appears to be uh, a, a better concept. However, if, if uh, you are given a situation where you want to manage a DHS uh, intertrochantic with unstable fracture, there are options how to augment the lateral wall with the lateral. I think Dr. Dilip Shah wants to make a comment. Please go ahead, sir. My whole talk was on that. All stable fractures, DHS, all unstable fractures, A3 or beyond, PFN, it's only choice for A2 types of fracture where if at all you decide, if you are well versed with DHS, then go with DHS, but do not neglect the unstability and try to stabilize with trochanteric stabilization plate. Otherwise, you can go ahead with PFN even in A2.2 and A2.3 fractures. Thank you very much for that comment. Dr. G.S. Kissel uh, wants to make a comment and then we move to the next session. Now, even in unstable fractures, DHS can be used provided to, one, you reduce the fragment, uh, head fragment in a slight valgus position and reduce all the fragments, medial and lateral wall fragments and fix them. If you fix them with the, uh, if you uh, uh, reduce all the fragments and fix them and compress them, then whether you use a DHS or whether you use a, a nail, it really doesn't matter. And with this wide spectrum of clinical experiences, we close this session and we start the next session, which is again a very interesting session. And what has changed in the uh, last few decades is the management of compound fractures with internal fixations. And may I invite uh, Dr. Dean Dalen for his lecture on open fractures, decision making in global early reconstruction. Please go ahead. Sir. You're muted, sir. You are muted, sir. Can you unmute yourself? Okay. Yeah, yeah. Now we can. Yeah, we can. Sorry. So, no, the global reconstruction in open fractures is something that often talked about nowadays, purely because of the advances and the techniques in both orthopedics as well as the plastic surgery is concerned. Purely because we know that as orthopedic surgeons, we know how to achieve a union. And if you combine with plastic surgeons, and then if you are also very good with uh, debridement, I think you can achieve the best results possible in very quick and early time. So, no, what is this? Sorry. Sorry, yeah, something is happening with you. No issue. We were able to see the presentation. Absolutely no problem. No, I think some other, the one that I, you asked me to do a video is coming up. Oh, so. Okay, okay. You can, you can share your presentation. No problem. Yeah. Just a sec. Yeah, yeah. okay. Uh, Chandra, how, how do I go to my desktop? Um, 
stop sharing and then uh, you have already stopped sharing hmm. so so you have to uh, click the share button first and then you will be able to go to the desktop yeah so arjun you can help sir so you are using a windows pc no just a sec just a sec i will go back to my desktop and then yeah 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 sorry yeah i just no 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 problems by the time any question on the youtube we can take up for the previous session by the time sir clicks so there are lots of questions lots of questions yeah so you can take one or two questions Dr. by the time Dhani sir dr shaikh has a question that what is the acceptable lower limit of neck shaft angle in it or subtrochanteric fractures during fixation i think kulkarni sir would be best to answer this question sir unmute yourself yeah sorry um see whether you use a subtrochanteric or trochanteric fracture it should never be the fragment should never be in a varus the head fragment should never be in a varus position it should be always be valgus position more than 135 or even 140 is acceptable lower limit of valgus uh, you should never be less than that okay is that uh, an, uh, yeah yeah Yeah, I think that is have a valgus angle. Mm -hmm. So go ahead, sir. Your your presentation is now seen. Yeah. Sorry, I just I'll reduce my talk time to two minutes. So the open fractures by far a global reconstruction is something that being talked about, and we know that we need to achieve bone union, and also like we need to prevent infection, and also restore function. the prevention of infection is mainly by debridement and then doing a early closure that means if you can provide a very good closed environment within within like 72 hours is the preferred time but within that day one if you can give a closed environment then that is the best for the open fractures these open fractures come in various forms either it could be a small wound or it can end up with having a mangled deformity or you can also have a polytrauma situations along with it if it is the other extreme like a mangled limb or the polytrauma i know that you are all going to manage as a severe form of injury where your hemorrhage is going to become the cause of concern and it is what you need to treat very well and as it becomes an emergency you have to show urgency in the casualty atls protocol hemorrhage management and the complexity of the wound has to be assessed very well antibiotic tetanus peroxide damage control surgery if appropriate and what we are looking at is the reconstruction option that we are going to look at this reconstruction moment you decide like all all the injuries you you are, you will decide whether to go for amputation or salvage moment you decide as a salvage pathway and we all do resuscitation debridement and skeletal stabilization on day 1 whereas soft tissue cover and definitely bony procedures are all almost always done as a staged reconstruction in many places but what we are discussing today is can from resuscitation to definitive procedures can be done in a single day day one procedure if this is the day one procedure that you need to do then there are various reconstruction options like you can fix and close you can fix reconstruct and close fix and skin graft fix and flap fix wait and reconstruct there are these are the various pathways by which you can choose but i know that fix and close fix reconstruct fix and skin graft can be done by an orthopedic surgeon but when it comes to flap and then doing microvascular and things like that becomes like a orthoplastic symbiosis and before you embark on all those methods of treatment what is important is the ganga hospital score and this ganga hospital score i am sure that many of you would be well versed with it purely because even the residents now they will be well versed because it is being asked in examinations what is the beauty of that ganga hospital score is that it provides global assessment of the severely injured limb and the patient all components of the limb and the comorbid factors are assessed separately and together individual score provides guidelines in treatment and total score helps to decide salvage and prognosticate the outcome there are two determinants in this skin score will let you know the suitability of cover whereas the total score is the one that you need to look at for the timing It's because total score is the one that is going to let you know what is the extent of violence and then hence you know when to time this uh, very well 
So let us look at this injury. If you look at it, the total score comes to four. And then you, you, all of you would definitely agree that this is a simple form of a simple treatment that you can issue. It is a nailing as well as if you have done extremely good debridement and there, there is no skin loss associated with that, you can go ahead to do all these on day one and then they end up having a good result. Similarly, you can see that the, compared to the previous one, the wound size is higher, but still the score remains four. So because, see, the size of the wound does not determine the score. You see, like, it is only whether the skin loss is uh, there or not that is going to determine the score. So again, you see, like, the same thing, you can do the nailing as well as closure and then go on to get a, a good result. On the contrary, you can see that the score is the same, but when there is a combination, sometimes it may be without soft tissue attachment. If the tuck test is positive, you are going to remove that bone and then once it ends up with the bone loss, and then you can also do a bone graft at that stage so that it can also act like a dead space management. And also you can also think that because more than one third circumference is lost, you can treat it like a primary management of a closed fracture situation. Only thing is at the end of it, you should be able to achieve a closure. And if you can do that without tension, skin tension, then again, this is also an option that you can think of in doing it when the score is less. See here it is the total score is seven, but you can see the skin score has increased. So the skin score has become four. So that means there is a skin loss at that stage. And if there is a skin loss, what you need to give is the flap. But the flap as well as the nailing and all these can be combined on day one if you have an orthoplastic symbiosis and then give a closed environment as quickly as possible. That is what can give you a good result. So let us look at this. this is the timing of reconstruction. That is the total score is the one that is going to be a guideline for you. We have found out in our series that total score of nine or below, it is easily possible for you to do a global reconstruction. Of course, the debridement is the key. And if you have done the debridement extremely well, that means you have got all the contaminations removed and you have a clean surgical wound at the end of your debridement, then there is no harm in going ahead and doing all these procedures on day one. There between a score seven and score, in score 13, there is a lot of difference because score 13 becomes a high violence. And from the impact zone to the next zone, there will be some ischemic zone. There can be some area of uh, muscle necrosis nearby place. Skin also can necros at later edit. So there is a difference between these two. And that is why when the score becomes more, you need to think of a staged reconstruction. Whereas all those before nine, less than nine, you need to look at as a global reconstruction. Here you can see this is the score is at eight. And if you do that, again, you can see the same day you can do everything that is possible and then you can have a, a good outcome. Whereas it becomes total 11. Here again, if your infrastructure is good and if you are able to make sure that you have got a clean, or wound at the end of the debridement. You can also do the flap, but may not be at the same date, but within 72 hours, if you do, still it is considered as a primary sort of a situation where you have done it within the primary healing phase. So that's what is important. But as if it crosses above nine, then please be careful that if, if you think that there is excessive angled limb sort of injury, then it's always the staged reconstruction that is good. And if you go on to do a staged reconstruction, again, they will have a, a good result. But what is important in all these open injuries is the success depends on first answering the question of salvage. And the timing of reconstruction is something that we are talking about today. And the timing, one of the best ever guidelines that you can ever get would be based on the Ganga Hospital score. And then the choice of the limb salvage pathway also is determined based on that. And also this gives you the complexity of open fracture. It also because of the comorbidities, everything that is being discussed, you can also go about and discuss about the complexity of these open fractures. And if the skin score of more than three always requires a flap, bone score of four or five requires a complex reconstruction like uh, transport or free people and things like that. But what is important is score of nine or less it indicates that you can go ahead and do early reconstruction. Of course, I'm still, again, I'm going to tell you that debridement is the key. So if the debridement is done extremely well, there is no harm about it. And all others, you, more than that, you are going to do a, a stage. Degree. So let us look at what you can do on day one. 
if the patient general condition and local wound condition permit you can go ahead and do a definitive fixation if cover is allowed so this is the most important thing what is important is also like personality is taken into account patient personality is very important and then you are, at every time you must discuss with anesthetist because this being the disease of hemorrhage we have to be conscious of the fact that there can be inflammatory markers that is coming up later so you'll have to continuously discuss whether the hypotension has been corrected and all those things must be taken care of so in case if there is a head injury associated with a limb limb injury like this and then you want to know whether it has to be staged or not head injury is one area where it needs oxygenation it needs ventilation it needs to be operated and then you have to keep them on oxygenation very well so that the brain function doesn't go down and the best of the time is to finish off all the surgeries that is there so it also depends on the what is associated with these injuries so if you all take into account and then based on this if the patient personality allows you to go ahead and do all the surgeries if the ganga hospital score is less than 9 i think the best safer option is to go ahead and do a total reconstruction that is including what is what is meant by what uh, professor chandak was telling us do implant fixation that is internal fixation and a cover on day one thank you very much thank you very much sir uh, for bringing out the concept of to uh, total global reconstruction when feasible in compound fractures next we have lecture uh, on tibial condyle fractures tibial condyle fracture has really seen lot of uh, revolutionary concepts in the last two decades and the whole fixation strategies have changed may i invite uh, dr harshad argekar for his lecture uh, on decision making plate selection and plate placement good afternoon and happy teachers day to all of us i thank the bombay orthopedic society dr rujita mehta and dr rajendra chandak for having me for this talk i am going to talk on the game changing three column concept which was uh, described in 2010 to define proximal tibial fractures we are all aware of and we have all used the traditional schadzger classification for proximal tibial fractures within a few fractures we also realize that there are some fractures which do not fall into the typical schadzger classification so almost 20% of these injuries you cannot classify according to schadzger so therefore this classification had its own limitations and the reasons were also very clear this classification uses only the ap view not not the lateral view this classification was designed when ct was not commonly available and ct scan was not wide in widespread use in 2010 the game changing paper on three column fixation of complex tibial plateau fractures came out of shanghai china by kong feng lao and his team and in this uh, concept they used the ct scan classification to define the fracture and to identify the components so before this paper we used to get tibial condyle fractures we had the posterior condyle this was seen but not very well recognized we used to fix it all from the lateral side ignoring the medial and the posterior side and we landed up with a reduction like this where you can see because the medial condyle is mal reduced the posterior condyle is not in place we get this kind of a mal reduction so the three column concept is a ct based concept it uses the transverse cut at the proximal end of the tibia to identify the broken columns and classify it into various types so what are these columns if you look at a transverse cut of the tibia from from the superior end you will see a medial column a lateral column and an entire posterior column the line dividing the anterior and posterior is a little arbitrary but it would be one which passes from a medial tibial tubercle on the medial side of the tibia to the anterior tubercle on the fibula now approximately this corresponds to a line which passes anterior to the lateral collateral ligament and goes posterior to the medial collateral ligament if you look at it from the lateral view you will see 
the disc corresponds to an area of the proximal tibia which is not supported by the main tibial shaft so here whenever there is an impact you will get shearing injuries so this will shear off and separate out wherever if you get an impacted injury here you will get a depressed fracture so the posterior part which is unsupported will go always in a shear injury whereas the anterior part which is supported will go for a depressed injury so depending on which column is fractured you can say this is a single column injury medial side single column injury lateral side <clears throat> or a single column injury posterior side and depending on the various combinations you can have a two column or a three column injury later on this classification was extended and the line dividing the medial and lateral condyle was extended posteriorly so now the posterior side also had a posterior medial fragment and a posterior lateral fragment so this three column concept was extended and made into a four column concept just for it's an arbitrary column uh, uh, definition it is just for ease of understanding and ease of explaining what fracture the patient has remember that this classification is not necessary to be used in all types of tibial condyle fracture only about 12% of the fractures require this three column fixation technique if you have a pure depression type this is called a zero column fracture or depending on which column is fractured you can call it a single column or two column or three column injury the work house for today's lateral fixation is this kind of an implant we have a pre contoured locking raft plate which will have four screws on the top which will hold up the elevated depressed fragment plus you have various combinations of locking and non locking screw a screw which goes from the lateral side to hold a posterior medial condyle this screw is this plate is a work house today we have evolved from p plates to l plates to hockey stick plates these were the ones which were used in previous times medial side implants have also evolved you have a medial locking plate a posterior pre contoured locking plate but for me the best implant on the medial side is either a t plate or a 3.5 recon plate the reasons for this i will explain as we go along another two important instruments you require for this surgery for proximal tibia is a femoral distractor it is used quite often though not for every case you require it if there is comminution and you need to get length or if it is an old fracture and reduction is a little difficult this is a, a reduction clamp with very wide uh, prongs and preferably ball tip so that you can hold reduction makes your job a little easier so lateral side i have the pre contoured raft plate as a standard plate medial side i prefer a thin implant i don't want a thick pre contoured plate so therefore i prefer an l plate or a reconstruction plate posteriorly because i go by the posterior posterior medial approach i don't have too much exposure distally the posterior uh, pre contoured locking plate is pretty long and sometimes passing the distal screws become a little difficult so my preference is the elis plate or the distal radius t plate you can either have it in a t configuration or an oblique t configuration and that will help me buttress the posterior fragment and sometimes you can tilt the plate and almost go up to the posterior lateral fragment also if i'm using a prone position then a pre contoured plate is actually a good plate to be used on the posterior surface remember the posterior and medial fixation is essentially buttress fixation so you really may not require a big thick strong plate you require a plate which will push the fragment back in place so a thin plate will do the job equally well so when you place the plates your anterolateral plate is generally just anterior to the fibula and the screw trajectory is such that none of them will go into the posterior medial fragment they will all skirt the posterior medial fragment and go into the medial condyle remember this that unless the medial condyle is reduced you can't pass in screws so long so unless you push the medial condyle back in place your screws from the lateral side should ideally not cross the midline they should just stay uh, proximal to the midline reduce the medial condyle and then your screws can go across the posterior medial plate is a buttress plate on this posterior medial surface anteromedial plate again is a buttress plate on the anteromedial surface and between these two plates you have the superficial medial collateral ligament 
which is actually covered by the pes ancillary muscle so the superficial medial collateral ligament needs to be protected and the plates should not come directly on top of it or you should not erase off the collateral ligament to put your plate in place the anterolateral approach is a workhorse approach and this is there is no controversy about it there is no uh, there is no other better approach on the lateral side the medial approach generally we use the posterior medial approach because it can give us access to the posterior medial fragment as well as the medial fragment itself that is the anterior medial fragment i'll show you how in the subsequent slides posterior lateral you can use this if you are fixing a posterior lateral fragment this generally involves osteotomy of the fibula or some kind of manipulation around the fibula so as to go behind the fibula from the lateral side and then the prone position actually is the best position for fixing the posterior condyle of the tibia but with a prone position generally you need to redrape and rescrub the patient turn him supine and then do the anterior surgery so i am not very keen on doing a posterior prone approach unless that is the only approach is which is required to fix that fracture i would prefer to do it in a supine position so that is my position i generally keep it with the knee at 90 degree flexion with a bolster or a pillow which is uh, wrapped in sterile uh, draping below the knee so it gives me almost a 90 degree angle this will give me easy access to the lateral side and if i go on the opposite side i can get an easy access on the medial side by just uh, making the hip abducted i can make it into a figure of 4 and the soft tissues are all flex the hamstrings are flex the gastrocnemius is flex so posterior exposure becomes a little easy in the lateral side i can easily pull up the meniscus and access the joint line i can visualize it and easily elevate the depressed spine also remember one thing when the patient is in this position the cm can't come directly from the top because that would not give you a proper ap view you need to tilt the cm beam by almost 40 degrees but again remember that if you keep it exactly at right angles to the tibia you will not get an actual plateau view to get a plateau view you need a 15 degree angle between the exact vertical and you need to direct the beam 15 degrees cordially so you need to keep this at around 30 degrees to get a plateau view and plateau view is important in order to determine whether you have elevated that fragment adequately or whether there is some residual depression still remaining anterolateral approach again there is nothing more for me to say this is a standard approach every textbook will describe it most important point which i want to make here is if there is a depressed fragment which you are elevating do not just depend on the ct scan or the cm views sorry do not depend on the cm views you require to actually elevate the meniscus see the depressed fragment and physically elevate it because it is much more depressed than what you would see on the cm the cm sometimes doesn't give a clear picture of how much elevation is required but if you actually see it and elevate it then your chances of going wrong are much much less with a void created you can use your raft screw below the fragment but if you are not certain after the raft screw you can also use bone grafting or before the raft screw you can put it with bone substitutes and bone grafts and then put your raft screw below the elevated fragment posterior medial approach i find is a better approach than the anterior medial approach this is the anterior medial approach and this is the posterior medial approach the posterior medial approach distally is parallel to the posterior border of the tibia and proximally it goes along the level of the hamstring uh, along the level of the pes anterior now why is this approach the posterior medial approach the distal end of your incision is parallel to the posterior medial border of the tibia and the proximal end is parallel to the muscles of the pes anterior muscle now with this approach you can get an easy access to the posterior medial condyle here bit going between the gastrocnemius and the pes anterior muscle it gives a good access to the posterior medial condyle you can almost see or at least feel the posterior lateral condyle if you dissect distally enough and proximally enough getting a posterior flap down you flex the knee you can almost go up to the lateral side of the posterior side of the tibia also if you dissect in the subcutaneous plane 
you can go anterior to the pes anserinus and thereby access this fragment which is the anteromedial fragment of the of the tibial condyle so you have access to the posteromedial fragment as well as the anteromedial fragment via this approach so this is the picture where you can see this is the pes anserinus it has been retracted back you can get an exposure of the anteromedial side and this is behind the pes anserinus you can actually retract it and pull it in the front and you can get access in the posterior side also there is a big skin bridge between the medial and lateral skin incision so there is no problem about skin necrosis you can easily put in three plates by these two approaches prone position actually is the best and the most comfortable approach if you are dealing only with the posterior condyle fracture there are problems with it which i have mentioned before a semi prone position is the actual position which was described in the 2010 paper you can see that the patient is kept in kind of a floppy lateral position where on extension you can access the posterior medial side whereas on flexion of the knee you can access the lateral side uh i have not used this this approach though some people will be may be quite comfortable with it i find a problem with this is that you might not get proper cm images because this leg is exactly not lateral and this leg is exactly not a so you may either have to rotate the leg or tilt the beam or tell your person to tilt the beam accordingly you do not operate in the presence of blisters absolutely no no if you operate in the presence of blisters especially those showing a hemorrhagic content you will end up in a situation where the skin will necrose and uh, just close to your suture the skin will break down so in the presence of a three column injury what is the sequence of fixation which you would use so i expose both by the anterolateral approach and the posterior medial approach simultaneously the first thing which i do is to identify the apex of the lateral fragment once the apex is identified i know where it will sit correspondingly on the tibia so my distal reduction is in place and this would generally keep my proximal fragment also back in place if there is a depressed fragment on the lateral side i will elevate it and use provisional k wires to fix the lateral fragment to the main tibial shaft but see to it that my wires do not cross on the opposite side where the medial condyle is still not reduced then i will expose posteromedially define the apex of the posteromedial as well as the post the anteromedial fragment if there is any and then put their apex. once the apices are back in place we use provisional k wires from lateral to medial side posterior to anterior side to fix my fragment provisionally then i would use a buttress plate with frag with screws only in the distal fragment to buttress this fragment back in place and to hold it in position and then go back on the lateral side if they are in place then i will go back on the lateral side and finish off the lateral fixation by the raft plate and then come back on the medial side and the posterior side and put the proximal screws so as to complete the fixation this is what i would generally do if there is a comminuted fracture then i would reverse my uh, sequence i would fix a plate on the lateral side first because that will help me to get the length and then go back on the medial side and then do my medial work but i will expose them simultaneously and put in plates uh, one after the other on both sides sometimes going on the medial side and sometimes on the lateral side it is not as if i finish off the lateral close everything and then go go on the medial and then finish off the medial that's not how it is done so just one case example you have a three column injury over here you can see there is a fracture of the lateral side that one that's a fracture of the medial side and that's a fracture of the posterior column so these are intra pictures your provisional reduction with k wires buttress plate on the medial side the recon plate is on the medial side the t plate is on the posterior side and this proximal screws are not put traction is given length is obtained lateral plate is put and then you complete the fixation on the medial side once the lateral side is okay so in summary the idea of the column concept was actually a game changer it is through this paper that our understanding of tibial condyle enhanced and our fixations improved
the city based classification but applicable only to about 15 to 20, 12 to 15 percent of factual not all of them so shadzga classification is not irrelevant it is still being used fixation of posterior fragment by buttressing is essential and you still don't have an ideal approach because there is no one approach which can which has all the advantages and none of the disadvantages i thank you very much for your patient listening thank you dr harshad for bringing out the changing uh, concepts in the and the bringing out the column concepts in tibial condyle fracture that was a wonderful lecture and next we have a lecture from dr rajesh gandhi and he'll be speaking on uh, tibial condyle fixations then now and future bone graft substitutes and rim fractures so we go ahead with the lecture of dr rajesh gandhi good afternoon everybody today we are going to talk about the tibial condyle fixation what is in store for us what was done in the past what is done in the present and what holds for us in the future now decades of progress from 1950s and 60s to 2021 has seen a sea change from lantern to light to laser now what was tried out in the earlier days was a cast brace from percutaneous screws to x fix to plating to anatomical plating and recently the posterior plating and the column according to the column concept multiple plating has been tried out and done with a decent amount, a good amount of success now cast braces can be used to unload the injured side of the joint they were once commonly used to stabilize the injured joint while permitting some degree of a joint mobility there they offered some advantages but mostly disadvantage there were no anatomical reductions the results were very poor and it is not a preferred method except in a very old patients who are not fit and who have fallen down in the house very severely osteoporotic then as a last resort when we don't when he is not fit for the surgery we can use this method now percutaneous fixations have been tried with a varying degrees of success the very it is very good for the single condylar fracture when the displacement is minimum displacement is easy to do by a closed means the percutaneous fixation holds good results results are variable otherwise and usually what are the fears we have are reduction is lost and uh, fixation is inadequate that is the time when one has to think whether augmentation with other modalities is required or not now ex external fixators for the compound fractures has uh, should test of the time when there is a severe combination the external fixator possibly holds the key and the poor skin and soft tissue uh, are present that is the time the xfix works best <clears throat> what are the types of xfix modalities available here we are showing you the jest fixator which is being used modified and used for the tibial condylar fracture with a good effect Elizaro has been used with a very good result, and it has stood test of the time. But it has a limited value. It is not done in every individual. So L plates were introduced in the early 60s, and it has stood test of the time when no other modalities were available. It still can be used selectively. It has got a consistently good results. Then came the three-column concept. Now the three-column classification defines. as it was discussed by dr harshad argekar very aptly it it is dividing the uh, upper end of the tibia in three columns medial lateral and posterior column again the posterior column is uh, divided into medial part and the lateral part posterior medial and posterior lateral and uh, it has stood test of the time anatomical plates were introduced the posterior tibial plates were introduced and they have become a gold standard the column concept as evolutionized the change of the modalities of a treatment for the uh, fractures of the proximal tibia they are showing a cons consistently good results multiple plating is a norm in a bicondylar fractures or a posterior uh, when there is a column uh, all the three columns or more than one column is affected now uh, usually the classification which is being used is either ao or a schadzger's classification but the ao and uh, th th there are array of fracture patterns are described and it is a science, standard description is usually according to the schadzger's classification now most of the fractures 
in the intra-articular tibia are associated with the ligamentous injuries and require proper assessment and interventions. The several patterns which has been described that fall outside the ambit of this classification, the rim fracture is one of them. There are two subtypes, compression rim fracture and avulsion rim fracture. The rim fracture poses a challenge not only for the reduction for the treatment modalities. Now, uh, literature is not very, very big on this. It's a sparse and uh, uh, very few cases are reported of an isolated rim fracture. The rim fracture associated with other fractures are associated, uh, are uh, being described very commonly. Now, what is the modality? Usually the open reduction is recommended. Distractor always helps in the reduction of a rim fracture. And then in one incision is not sufficient. More than one approach is needed for uh, mobile immobilization. The associated ligament injuries need attention and the rim plate is used more commonly. Many times the rim plate has to be augmented with the other modality, other plates also. And uh, augmentation adds to the stability of the fracture. Early mobilization is possible and results are consistently good. Now, what is in store for us in the future? A lot of newer techniques have been devised. There is a bidirectional traction device is being used. The balloon tibiaplasty is being used. The three-dimensional 3D printing is being used to assist and help us in understanding the patterns, arthroscopy and fracturoscopy. These are the terms, uh, the, these are the modalities which are being used along with the normal modalities to help us achieve a good result. What is the bidirectional traction device was developed by the Chinese surgeon, Professional Zhang, and has been uh, and has been used for the tibial plateau fractures with ligamentotaxis with satisfactory results. Minimally invasive plate synthesis is then often used to augment the fixation. This is the uh, picture of a bidirectional uh, traction device. It is used as a rapid distraction device. The distraction is achieved on the table and minimally invasive plate syn osteosynthesis is being carried out along with it. Now, what, how is bidirectional plating done? A bidirectional uh, traction device is used. It is uh, the K wires are passed in the distal tibia and distal femur and they are attached to a uh, uh, transverse device and then that device is attached to, in turn, attached to the vertical device. So in a two direction, the distraction is achieved and then by minimally invasive technique, the de depressed fragment is being elevated. Once the elevation is done and assessed on arthroscopy, then you can, the, the minimally uh, plate osteosynthesis is being done. It is shown to give a decent results and it is the because the treatment modality is new, it is it is being evaluated and being tried out. Now, a balloon tibiaplasty is represented as an improved and accurate modality for the restoration of the articular congruence with the advantage of being minimally invasive and creating a symmetric contained defect to hold a bone filler for a subcontrol support. So here the balloon is injected and it is the fracture fragment is raised and the balloon is deflated and the cavity is filled with the uh, either cement or a, a scaffolding device, a bone graft devices. Now here there is a, a small a schematic representation of a tibial plateau fracture wherein cannula is inserted from a medial side. The three raft K wires are inserted just to give a support. A balloon is attached to the inflation device. The balloon is inflated, which results in elevation of a uh, depressed fragment. Once the balloon is inflated, the balloon is deflated, producing a void of a non-volume. Cannulated screw is passed. That acts as a raft screw that supports the depressed fragment. And the defect is being void, is being filled with either with a bone cement or with a uh, calcium sulfate cement, which is available and which is measured depending on the whatever uh, capacity of the balloon has been inflated. But the minimally, is very, uh, there is there are a few papers and most of them were initially arising from Hong Kong and they have, they have shown minimally invasive treatment of the TPL plateau depression fracture using balloon tibioplasty. They, they have described it as a 
and they have followed it up for 27 months. The clinical and radiological outcome was basically measured uh, depending on the cement absorption within the post-operative course in AP and lateral radiographs. The radiological absorption was one-fifth at the mean of 18 months. There was no osteolysis reported and mean Vomex score was 93, which is good enough. It is showing a promising clinical and radiological results. A lot of literature is still uh, awaiting publication on this. Now, 3D printing usually helps surgeon in uh, reducing the surgical time and exposure to the radiation. Basically, the, it is it is not a modality of a treatment, but it definitely helps accurate anatomical structure of the fracture is being recognized and pre-operative planning and the operative planning is really good with this. And one can actually simulate the surgery before one does the, does the surgery. Now, fracturoscopy or arthroscopy associated with arthroscopy is a superior to fluoroscopy in the articular reconstruction of the complex tibial plateau fractures. Decent amount of literature is present on this and it has almost become a, a regular modality with uh, quite a few of us. Now, tibial condylar fixation, the bone graft substitutes which are being used, over the last decade, there has been a substantial increase in the number of bone graft substitutes which are available to the orthopedic surgeon. As, as much as 59 bone graft substitutes are marketed by 17 companies, despite all this, the autologous graft is still considered to be the best. A fundamental disadvantage of autograft is a donor site mobility. Otherwise, it is considered as a gold standard. The graft substitutes which are available are the calcium phosphate cement, hydroxyapatite granules, calcium sulfate, bioactive glass, tricalcium phosphate, demineralized bone matrix, allografts, and xenografts. Bone grafts should have following properties osteoconduction, osteoinduction, osteogenesis. Most of the substitutes available are not able to provide all these things in one particular product. So they do provide a varying degree of osteoconduction and osteoinduction facility. Osteogenesis is still a dream. The use the meta-analysis was done by Thomas Goff and Nicholas K. Kanakarais. Uh, this meta-analysis, 19 studies were analyzed, reporting on a 674 patients. Now, fracture healing was uneventful in over 90% of them. Secondary collapse of the knee joint surface of more than 2 mm was reported in approximately 10% of the cases. The primary surgical site infection was 3.6%, not very statistically significant. Over, overall, a sufficient evidence is there to support the use of bone graft substitute at the clinical setting of a depressed plateau fractures. So we can safely conclude that the bone graft substitutes are a decent alternative to autologous bone graft when the defects are small. A larger defect wherein one has to combine autograft and uh, uh, the bone graft substitutes. That would give a decent result. Thank you. I thank you everyone for the kind attention and Thank you, Dr. Rajesh Gandhi, for bringing out the modern concepts and uh, new innovations. Thank you very much for that lecture. Uh, we now have uh, the discussion at the end of all these four sessions. All the four sessions were really absorbing. Harjit, we'll take question one by one. Can you please take up from the YouTube? Hello, question to Dr. Harshad Argekar, sir. What while placing the raft plate, uh, it is often difficult to place it perfectly uh, in both places, either uh, placing it superiorly or inferiorly, sometimes it doesn't fit the contour. And also if it fits, sometimes it is difficult to determine anterior or place or posterior placement, how much posterior to put it down. So uh, in order to place the plate, now you need to really expose up to the, the the tibiofibular joint, the anterior portion of the tibiofibular joint. And that is the limit as to which you can go posteriorly. Beyond that, it is just not possible. So your back limit is defined. The superior limit should be just below the articular surface. What I would generally do is after getting the elevation, I put a K wire which skirts below the articular surface. So I know that my raft plate is now going to go below. So posterior and superior extent is now defined. 
Now, depending on where the fracture line is, you can go either too much anterior or too much posterior. If you put it too anterior, there's a problem that the angle, the front angle of the plate stays subcutaneous and sometimes it hurts. So the anterior limit some is defined by the anatomy of the patient as well as the anatomy of the tibial. So once that three limits are defined, your place, plate is very well placed. Now, since this is a locking plate, even if it is a little bit away from the bone, because the shape of the tibia may not be same for every person, even if it is a little away from the bone, it is not a problem. However, there is a trick. If you really want to push it close to the bone, what you first do, like in any buttress plate, you put a non-locking screw in the distal fragment. And in the proximal fragment, before you put your wrap screw, you can use a non-locking screw or cortical screw just to push the plate close to the bone and then put your other raft locking screw so your plate stays close to the bone and then change that non-locking screw, screw over to a locking screw. This is not the ideal way. You can have the plate a little away, but if it is too far away, you can use this method to push the plate onto the bone. Thank you very much. Yeah, next question. So there is a question from uh, Dr. Shyam Mukhi, sir, uh, uh, to Dr. Vivek Shetty, sir, how to address rotational instability in intertrogantric fractures with no lateral wall? Um, can we stick to questions for this session? And then committing the back to this one. Okay, sorry. Yeah, yeah, okay. Perfect. Question by Dr. Nicholas Antao about anterior part of tibia with ACL and meniscus are all outside this classification. Can you give some tips to fix all at the same time to all faculty in the last session? Yeah, actually, it's a very good question, but really no definite answer to it. I have never had a chance to do both of them simultaneously because I don't do arthroscopies uh, as a routine. But yes, it is possible and uh, it is uh, very much uh, feasible to do both uh, fixations at the same point of time. There is a little bit of risk of the fluid leaking and causing compartment syndrome, but if you are aware of it and take measures to prevent it, you can get it done. Mm -hmm. Dr. Rajesh Gandhi assistant. Yeah, as you rightly pointed out, uh, arthroscopy assisted uh, procedure, if you are doing, it should be a dry procedure. Because when we are doing the wet procedure, when we are put, instilling the saline, then it can seep into the posterior compartment, which had happened to us and which is reported in the literature as well. So that should, that care should be, uh, one should be careful about that. So uh, intercrucial reconstruction is done many times together. Now, uh, if given a choice, I personally would do it at a later stage. Let the tibial condylar fracture heal. Uh, reports have been there where they have done it at the same sitting with the uh, pull-out stitches, etc. But then the stability is not uh, guaranteed. That is the reason it has been not been done so routinely. I would also do it as a second stage. I don't do it primarily. Yeah. There is a question by Dr. Makkar uh, regarding what length difference between medial and lateral plates uh, for a bicondylar fracture in terms of screws uh, do you prefer? So ideally the lateral plate should be the longer plate depending on the fracture configuration of course. If you have both fracture line medial and lateral side at the same level, you generally keep the lateral plate a longer plate and the medial plate a smaller plate because the medial and posteromedial plate are essentially buttress you don't require four screws distally. You can have only two screws or maybe three. And that is enough to get that uh, that uh, plate buttressing the medial side. So essentially, posterior and medial plates are smaller than the lateral one. And Dr. one thing Sharkin, that at yes. least one inch difference between the plate sizes, at least one inch. So oh, that you're not allowing the stress uh, fractures. Right. At least one inch or uh, possibly one and a half diameter of a tibia at that particular level. Because that will prevent the stress fractures of the at the uh, at the plate ends. So, Doctor Shakir, I invite Doctor Shakir Kavadia sir to have a comment for tibial condylar fracture. There's one thing I wanted to say because I saw what Doctor what Rajesh showed about the Chinese thing about the traction to get the tibia in alignment. Uh, what uh, I would if your fragment if your fragments are badly comminuted and you are planning just to put in uh, MIPO plates, what I usually do is on the table, I put the patient on the fracture table, 
and I reduced the tibia under traction as you would have done for a neck femur. And 99 out of 100, it reduces completely. And then your procedure for your fixation is done very, very quickly because you just need to take one incision on either side and do a MIPO with the CM and your alignment and everything goes off very, very well. But you put the uh, base plate together along, you let the base plate remain so that it is supported or you don't let it? No, just leave the leg hanging like how you would have done a normal leg femur on the foot plate and you give proper traction and 99 out of 100, the tibia just falls into place. Okay. Put the sagging of the fracture, sagging at the fracture side. You try it out and see next time it doesn't okay. happen. Yeah, we will. Sir, wait for this. It's a good tip. So one thing so, is the so this is use of femoral distractor in trop. That that really solves that the problem. That is the procedure. You can just put the patient on a traction table, and your work is done equally well. Try it out and do give me your feedback in the future. No problem. So so traction is important. Whatever way is best suitable in the circumstances, I think. That would be the answer. Arjot, next question. We have very interesting questions. So please wait for a few minutes so that we take up all the questions. Please go Is ahead. Is there any roll of 6.5 mm hockey plates now uh, or raft plate has replaced it altogether? Yeah. According to me, that 6.5 millimeter screw on the proximal fragment is a very, very thick screw. And it's sometimes uh, when the fragments are comminuted, the 6.5, you can put only two through the hockey stick plate. Also, the contour of the hockey stick plate is not perfect. Sometimes when you pass the hockey stick plate, it actually over compresses and sometimes you find that the lateral condyle is even lateral to the plate. The plate sometimes just simply sinks inside. So according to me, the hockey stick plate, which used to be a wood implant at a point of time where we had only L plate and T plate, now is on the way out. In fact, I would rather not use it. I would use an L plate or a T plate, which has got a better contour. And definitely, if I have a choice, I use the raft plate because the screws are also thinner diameter and I can pass multiple screws. So, holding of the depressed elevated fragment is much better, the wider surface. And it okay. almost fills the void. So, there is a very little uh, bone graft required. Okay. Yeah. So, Arjit, are we, are we finishing the questions on the table condyle fracture? Then we we'll take up all questions. Yeah. Have been yeah. Finished so, we had we also had a lot of questions on the lateral wall uh, uh, session. So we can take those questions because we cut it at that time. So uh, please go ahead. Dr. Mukhi also wanted to have multiple suggestions on his technique of lateral wall reconstruction by enders and tension band wire. I think we have seen all his results and he had put up a lot of questions to Dr. Shetty sir also. So Dr. Shetty, you would like to answer one of those questions? Uh, sorry, I have well, I, I didn't look at the question. So why did, what was the question that uh, Dr. Muki had? Uh, Harjo, can you enumerate the question? Yes, sir. Uh, sir Dr. Muki sir has a question for Dr. Shetty, sir. How to address rotational instability in, let, in cases with lateral wall involvement? So uh, as long as you have a medial continuity or a lateralization of the shaft and anterior continuity, the nail takes care. You have a, you have a screw proximally, you have a screw distally that takes care of the rotation. Dr. G.S. Kulkarni, sir, wanted to answer on this question. No, uh, I feel that uh, lateral stability is established because only if you fix all the fragments, all the fragments has to be fixed. Then only you get the uh, stabilization. And there is a stability is also established. Uh, everything is uh, falls in place. If you anatomically put all the fragment, even if it is small, Another comment I would like to say is if the uh, in uh, Vivek's cases, I saw many cases where the tip of the greater trochanter has been shifted medially. And when that happens, the abductor muscles uh, are not working properly. And then the patient has a bad limp. An elderly patient with a limp is, comes back with a fall or something. And then he, his bad limp is also there. So I feel all the fragment must be fixed and compressed. And that is the only way to treat uh, uh, intertrochantric co complex intertrochantric fractures, whether you use DHS or whether you use nail easy material. Thank you. Next question, Harjot. 
there is a question to Dr. Vivek Shetty, sir. In many of your cases, uh, the nail has been passed through the fracture site. So, uh, how to avoid distraction when the entry point is at the fracture only? And how to prevent screw back out and when to release traction? So, uh, just to summarize, if there is a comminution and a four part where there is a uh, the tip of the the greater trochanter is in too many pieces. Uh, the entry point is inevitably from the fracture site. Uh, you cannot kind of get all that fragment together and get the nail tip going in. The fact that uh, if you again pay attention to the anterior cortex, most of my the presentation that is seen, we hardly pay attention to what is happening in the lateral view. So if you get a good anterior continuity, if there is a media, good medial continuity, there is no question of the fracture collapsing. The nail is already there in situ. If you are worried about the core, you lateralize the shaft, the calcar will come and rest on the medial cortex. So there is no question of any further collapse happening. And therefore, the screws don't back out. So in the Masala Vela paper that we showed, the collapse was just about a millimeter or two. The tip of the jeter trochanter, it's a large area where the abductors attach. The tip of the trochanter, I do not spend a lot of time when I get the entry point. Provided you spend a lot of time trying to get your anterior and medial reduction properly. So most of the, the problems that I see are that it has not been reduced anteriorly well. It are just AP X-rays which are shown. And you look at why the Z effect or the reverse Z effect that is happening because there is an instability in the reduction and that is what is the screw which is backing out. And even in Professor Shivashankar's cases, he is using the head of the screw to pre make sure that it is seating, seating well. So he also doesn't find the, re the requirement of the lateral wall. Between a PFNA, which is fixed, and a DHS with a tier, trochanteric stabilization plate, there is absolutely no difference in outcome. There are large data on that. But you need to recognize if you're using a sliding hip screw, you need an extension plate in an unstable situation in a lateral wall. If it is just a nailing, I don't see the requirement of a lateral wall in the 200 odd cases that we have seen. But these are the steps that I have shown stepwise and how I go about it. When do you release the traction? The, so once the helical blade is put in, the, at that point, uh, uh, the compression screw is put on the helical blade. Once the compression is occurred at the fracture uh, at the fracture site, then the traction is released, and uh, the locking bolt distally is done. So that is the sequence of uh, releasing the traction and fixing. Harjot, I think, uh, yeah, Dr. Shah, you wanted to uh, comment. Yeah, I thoroughly concur with the viewpoints of Dr. Vivek Shetty, and I was given the topic of DHS in unstable fractures, so I had to speak on that. But as he truly said that when you do DHS in unstable fractures, that too also you can restrict to A2 types only. Do not venture for A3 types. And then you have to use some support. And maybe we may not agree with the idea of uh, Professor Kulkarni that each and every fragment has to be fixed. Once you have done a PFN pretty well and you have maintained uh, the valgus pretty well, there are some small fractures which can be overlooked. But that doesn't mean that you have to overlook big chunks because sometimes we waste more time in trying to fix the postromedial fragment, which is unnecessary. If you do a perfect PFN, you do not need to struggle to fix up small, small pieces. Don't solve a jigsaw puzzle to 100%. Ma'am, uh, uh, Dr. your inputs about the sessions and... Uh... Uh, so I think what... Uh... I mean, I'm really a pediatric orthopedic surgeon. So for me, what was most enjoyable is it really brought me back to my uh, residency days and all the memories of CG Pradhan, JC Taraparwala came in floating all over again. Um, they say that uh, technique can be taught by a master, but wisdom can only be the intuitive quotient of the master's experience of all these years. So uh, I think Dr. Chandak sir and Dr. Shakir Bhai have really, really brought about a perfect synergy of these things in all four sessions. First of all, the choice of uh, the concepts, then the way the talks and the sessions were designed and the cases. 
yes, there's always a limitation. I think trauma you can never have enough of, especially in Bombay Orthopedic Society. And when there was so much to talk about. So I think it's good to have so much fodder for thought given all over again. And really minute but practical points brought out by each and every speaker from each and every session. Be it uh, back or be it syndesmosis, be it uh, lateral wall or be it um, internal fixation. I think I really can't choose uh, which one was uh, really outstanding. All four were like absolutely neck to neck and uh, very, very brilliantly done master series. And I'm sure each of you masters has such a lot more to tell. So, I mean, I would urge all of you to keep on uh, using the BOS channels and share your cases uh, on all these different forums, even the uh, newsletter and the other things that Swapnil has been bringing out. So that, you know, I think our delegates really, really get enriched by these kind of master series. Thank you very, very much. Yeah. And a big and, naman to all the teachers. And, and, on one teacher's question, and, and one question to you. What do you do about syndesmosis injuries? Do you find them in pediatric patients? So trauma, ankle fractures as such uh, is a little less. It is more towards the adolescent age group that we see uh, these fractures. So by and large, we also uh, kind of go by the principles which guide uh, any ankle and, uh, ankle yeah. and foot and fixation. Foot there is an increasing importance which is now being given to syndesmosis even in the uh, pediatric age group, especially the posterior malleolus and telope. When you're yeah. dealing with that, we really look at that part very, very minutely. And at the end, uh, Dr. Pradeep Munod left us with a case. So we were all thinking, how does nature help improve an unstable situation? So Dr. Munod, you uh, are suggesting some answers to your query. No, so as I was mentioning, I don't have an answer and I'm still thinking why it has happened. Means, when this patient was ready for surgery, surgeon was ready for surgery and uh, over a period of time, within say a year, she's come to almost normal. Yes, there's a slight still waiting of the medial side, but she's asymptomatic. And I was discussing with uh, Dr. Gawale sir also, what is the reason? I don't know. And that's why I put it up on this forum and with all the okay. trauma experts and everybody. Uh, to share their knowledge and see why it has happened. So we respect our guru and we ask the comment Rajan, from our guru. Yeah, Rajan, uh, Rajan, I, have, yeah. I, have a, I have a question to Rujuta. Oh, <laughs> Shall I? Yeah, 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 please. please. Bula, bula, bula. We have a very, very interesting case of an eight-year-old boy with ACL injury. All uh -huh. points, everything, the uh, Latchman test is positive, everything is positive. He is eight-year-old. <laughs> We have divided opinion about uh, management. Somebody, someone says no treatment is required at eight years old. The other people say that no, he is uh, he's having for this for last one year and suffering and uh, limping badly. But you have any experience with this? So we've seen a few, sir, uh, ACL deficient knees in uh, things like Larson syndrome, where reconstruction has been done. Mm -hmm. um, very few people really uh, attempt this and know how to do it well. But mm -hmm. I think most of the scopists who really even indulge in this now do what is known as physial sparing reconstructions. And that's mm -hmm. coming up in a big way, but it doesn't really come to the pediatric orthopod as much as it goes to the scopy specialists. Mm -hmm. And uh, eight-year-olds, traumatic once in a while. I mean, I would have seen a few here and there, and that's why I never let go of Dominic. Silva from Wadia because I've said that every time we need a scope, you have to come and do it for us. And he can really go into, I mean, even a three-year-old uh, knee, he has scoped for me at times. So there is a value to it, a definite indication, but much less. I mean, uh, yeah. your uh, experience would be far, far larger in terms of all of that. Yeah, thank you very much for that comment. And uh, after this, we have opinion from and the closing comment from Dr. Shakir Kapadia, sir. And then over to Bombay Orthopedic Society, President Tensor. Uh, thank you very much. for uh, Thank you, everyone, for an excellent uh, Sunday. I'm sure it has been... I have learned a lot today. And there's been a very good learning. We've been exposed to different, different views from so many different people and new, new things happening all the time. And I'm sure the audience who are listening to us probably are are more confused now than they were in the morning when we started. So I think that is the whole purpose of this exercise, that you keep your horizons open and keep on listening, keep on learning, keep on doing new, new things. And as Rujuta said, 
inform us and everybody else share with us what you're doing this is learning for all of us and i'm sure everybody is i mean thanks everyone once again for everyone thank you dr rajendra for a extremely hard work and dr arjun i have been a, almost a bystander in this situation except for hassling rajendra for a few topics which i thought were very important and between the two of us we decided all these four things come off very very well and uh, i suppose uh, that's it i don't have much to say thanks rajuta thanks bombay orthopedic society thank you Can very much thank sir. dr nasir shah uh, who has been our mc observer and listening and participating very uh, actively very yes. welcome change from usual mmc observers <laughs> thank you very much sir for that thank you very much and uh, sangeet you would like to say something and then yeah. the secretary yes. from two of you have crafted the program very well dr chandash and kapadia and you have selected a faculty who would really put hard work in their presentations to make the audience understand and make it as clear as possible and i also thank uh, all the speakers uh, who have made efforts in making a presentation they have uh, spent lot of time on that and last but not least the webmasters dr tiku avinash T agnivesh tiku and uh, dr shitij choudhary both of them we appreciate for the efforts for putting in four to five hours and before that in recording uh, all the lectures thank you very much swapni thank you thank you sir thank you very much sir and uh, before we end uh, just the last comment the actual game changer and all this is the technique and technology which gets us together binds us and uh, this program has been seen by so many people that it is really something which was never known before the advent of such technology so on behalf of the bombay orthopedic society i thank all the faculty the panelists and the guest presenters uh, my president dr gawale vice president dr rujuda mehta the entire executive council and both of the masters for their effort thank you so much have a nice day. thank you thank you very much and uh, we close this session thank you for this opportunity thank you so much